Hello, everyone. Woo, we're back. Hey, been two whole years. Man, <laughs> okay, crazy. <laughs> Finally, we've returned. This is our second anniversary of not doing an open bar, and here we are. We're, we're here to put it right. So, welcome back, everyone. It's uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we took a week off last week so that I could go on vacation. And you know, I came back and I just thought I'm just gonna keep my clothes on, just carry on working. So, here mm -hmm. I am. It's better to do this job with clothes on, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, when I'm when I'm just editing videos, I can just be in my underwear yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. But yeah, when I when I'm actually on live streams, YouTube tends to frown on that degree mm. of nudity, so it's better to put something on. So yeah, get yes, no. yourselves lucky. I've got a shirt on at least. It's oppression, that is. It's, uh, you know, we have to live under that, but that's YouTube for you. Yeah. Well, I believe in free the nipple, Mauler. Um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Men or women. <laughs> Anyway, well, it's good to be back and it's good to be doing this again. So welcome everyone. This is open bar number 90. We're into the oh, 90s gosh. now. Can you believe it? I mean, it's a cool, cool era, just saying. It is, yeah. The 90s was a great time. That was my childhood right there. Too, too young to remember the 80s and too drunk to remember the 2000s, but I remember the 90s. That's like the one part of my life I can cling on to. And it was a good time. I liked it. Anyway, well, we should bring in some of our guests this evening because we've got a, a good old panel for you tonight. Let's uh, let's bring in our first guest. We have mm. got, making her return, the one and only Baggage Claim. Welcome Hi, back. Great to Thanks. have you back. Thank you. Good to be back and welcome back from your first retirement. I'm sure there'll be, it's the first of many. I could only stay off for a year and then I had to come back. So <laughs> what can I do? And uh, I'm also excited to talk about Kong. It, I think it has usurped <laughs> my favorite movie of all time, Lord of the Rings. It's now Kong, just so you guys know. It is legendary, and there's so much hidden meaning to that movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it I had can... a lot. It represented me very well. There was a, a <laughs> brown woman in that movie, so I feel very represented. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, Kong is big and hairy, so I felt represented, so that was great. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, welcome on board, and uh, we're going to bring in our next guest here. It's um, he is the despotic ruler of Antrim himself. Welcome, the despots. And hey, he's like new beard. Oh yeah, I got the, I got a lamy going on. <laughs> you know what Noel Gallagher said about the nineties? He said the nineties was the last great decade. I think that's a great quote. I think he might be right as well. Yeah, I think yeah. so. You could kind of argue, yeah, that's uh, that's when things became a bit generic after that. I don't it's know, guys. The 20s has been great. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you, you know, I, I definitely couldn't accuse the 2020s of being generic. That's for sure. It's been eventful, just maybe not in a good way. But... Yeah, the 2020s is like when you say, yeah, the director deserves his vision, then you go, oh, not that vision. But yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, well. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one. I feel like you, you could rewind like 10, 15 years. And I feel like, you know, the fashions, the technology wouldn't be that different. They wouldn't be so different as they were back in the nineties. You know, it's uh, yeah, it became a bit of a weird time. We plateaued as a society, I think, and it, probably we're going backwards now. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I feel like nineties would have been. I, I wouldn't mind rewinding back to the nineties. You had like the right level of technology, but not social media. So that was perfect. I think that was like the perfect, where you could communicate. You could communicate with each other quite easily, but you didn't have to do it over social media. Uh, technology was, was still cool too it was the end of the analog era and, the, and digital was only just starting near the end of the 90s so it was this nice mix whereas now everything's digital and sterile and boring <laughs> and now, now your fridge has a tv subscription to fucking amazon prime You're just like <laughs> <sighs> well yeah it was like you have to wait for your fridge to update because it's downloading the latest <laughs> patch it's like your fucking fridge just like chill things stop doing stop trying to do other stuff yeah, it was it was a different time, and well, it was the last era where before we had the internet, 
and man, I just remember things like the PlayStation suddenly becoming like that that made gaming cool and it kind of brought it into like that modern era where you could actually have half decent graphics, you know, and it wasn't just little sprites on a on a cutesy screen, but oh well, you know, there there's a whole there's a whole different conversation to be had around that. But anyway, before we do that, we should bring in our final guest this evening. Um he is He's a regular alcoholic at the open bar, and it's always good to have him back. He is the smallest of platoons. <laughs> Welcome back. Always good to have Thank our alcoholics. <laughs> yes, the al alcoholics assemble. It's good <laughs> to have you back, my friend. It was the nice thing about the 90s as well, is that the, the most like pessimistic people got was near-future dystopias like The Matrix and Terminator 2, you know, Skynet taking over the world. 2020 is just, yeah, it's not that, but you do have the Marvels, and in a way, that's worse. So it's that but boring. Culture has actually got worse. Like, it, it, like, a nuclear war would be way more interesting than what we got. <laughs> yeah, at this point, I'm waiting for our machine overlords to annihilate most of us. I it's, think it'll it's be so bizarre. the best thing that ever happened. <laughs> we do live in the worst time. Like, it's like we live in the worst of... Orwell, but with also the worst of Huxley. It's like the two just combined. It wasn't one or the other. It's bizarre. <laughs> it's got a little element of Demolition Man in it as well, which is, yeah. you know, it just it's not even like a, a really like brutalistic um, style of, of um, dystopia like you got in Orwell. It's everyone's just kind of pushy ass and oh, retarded. By the way, really... Drinker, I was, I was going to ask you, do you think you're going to get reported to the Scottish police during this live stream? I think my yeah, like probably for the sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this like my physical appearance is a hate crime. Speaking of our <laughs> speaking of our welly, and I mean, if I if I call the spot the, the the police and say that you you visually offend me or your shirt is offensive to Native Hawaiians or something, like would that count? No, because you're white and you're male. Mm. But um, if you were a woman or but if I did it, you could. Do Where's it the phone sure. number? <laughs> <laughs> um, Platoon could probably do it as a minority, or you know, as an underrepresented group or something. Yeah. So you guys could probably get away with it. So uh, yeah, how about it? Um, see, like, Humza Yusuf will be at my front door before you can say um, this is ridiculous. <laughs> All I can say is thank God for J.K. Rowling standing up for, uh, standing up against that law. I yeah, I mean, I, I've got to applaud her stance there. I mean, you know, that's, I guess, the sort of thing you can get away with when you're a billionaire, massive public figure with a huge profile that they couldn't possibly go after. But it does make me wonder well, what happens to like the little guy who can't afford like the biggest lawyers on the planet and who isn't yeah. a public figure. What's going to happen yeah. to them if they tell an off color joke or they share a meme on social media without understanding it? It's... They turn Glasgow into a prison, and then we have Escape from Glasgow with all the hate crime people who have to you know, band together and, and beat the barbarians and get out alive. That's, I think, the future of Scotland. I mean, well, most like, people in Glasgow are trying to escape from there anyway, so you know they've got plenty of training. Turn it into a <laughs> Glasgow city, and then have like a Scottish Batman will be running around trying to save the whole city from whatever I wonder what he Could would you be imagine like. a Scottish <laughs> Batman? How fucking fat <laughs> he would be! And <laughs> like, how you <laughs> We need that movie because the superhero genre needs to be parodied, like really, like badly needs to be just brutally parodied for how silly and stupid and ridiculous it's become. Scottish Batman is ideal. It's a great candidate. I think so, yeah. He, like, you know, when he gets beat up and stuff, he eats like a deep fried Mars bar to give himself more energy. Yeah, <laughs> he and he just goes fast. after people for hate speech instead of hate crimes. Yeah, that indeed. <laughs> His thing is that he loves fighting. He he goes around looking for fights, but he, he'll only <laughs> fight guys that, that deserve it and who are bad guys. It's kind of like, you know, the Dexter TV show. It's like that, only he tries to use his chronic need to fight for the good of the people. Well, I think like you would do the typical like Scottish night out thing where like he'll pick the guy that he looks like he can beat. But then he'll, he'll see like the, the guy's got like a mate Back next to him who's like fucking enormous, like a bodybuilder, and be like, nah, I don't want any of that. <laughs> like, just run away. I have a problem with him, the tiniest yeah. guy in the bar. Yeah. However, Batman aside, um, we have all, almost all of us, seen the absolute cinematic wonder that is Godzilla X Kong, the new empire. And Mahler, I know you haven't experienced it yet, but I'm hoping... I haven't experienced the other one either, where they first teamed up or fought. I don't even know what happened in that one. Have you seen any of them? I've seen Godzilla 20... Was it 16? 
2014, Brian, I think it was. It was really old. I always mix up whether it's 14 or 16. Either way, Brian Cranston, Godzilla, and I call it that because the, the parts with him are pretty good. Parts without him I, are pretty shit. Well, um, I was going to say, what if you really want a piece of tonal whiplash, watch that movie again and then skip straight no, to Godzilla versus Kong. <laughs> well, the, the transition was slower than people expect because King of the Monsters became quite goofy. It's not exactly the most serious. It's got some silly shit in there, and that's when people started to say, hey, Godzilla isn't supposed to be taken that seriously. If you were a Godzilla fan, you know that. Um, even though the Brian Cranston one is very serious, that is a uh, yeah, that is a very like you're meant to, and you got that from the, the trailer. Skull Island was nonsense as well, like in terms of just having fun. So it's been a weird tone of a universe. But as far as I know, yeah, they've gone the craziest they've ever been is the latest one. Is if Skull I had Island to the Peter Jackson one? I that's not in this. Uh, no. no, that's oh. uh, that's a, a different Kong. Oh, okay. yeah. um, so this one is set like during the Vietnam War for some bizarre reason, and it's got Samuel L. Jackson and um, Tom Hiddleston and Brie Larson in it. Um, yeah, but I felt like that movie kind of tried to take itself seriously. There was a lot of scenes where you thought like it's trying for something really significant or some some piece of emotional resonance here like the conflict between the the humans and kong um which made it all the more hilarious for how goofy it was but this one just goes full-on ridiculous nonsense um and i kind of love it for that <laughs> like i had a weird experience watching this film where um i stopped fighting the stupidity and I just allowed it to wrap me up like a big comforting blanket of retardation. <laughs> and I felt no. great afterwards. <laughs> I, I think that's I was one jarred. of the things. I was jarred right off the bat because they, uh, the, you know, they have an opening shot of Kong, and immediately he's caught up in this like car chase esque scene where he's being followed by some very hideous looking creatures. And I was like, yeah, this is just gonna be, this is just gonna be as much as loud and action packed as possible for for even like no silence for even a second. It's like we're gonna go just from whiplash from one me one <laughs> thing to another. Yeah, um, I I think. With this movie, um, like you say, it sets that tone right off the bat. It's um, he's he's fighting all these monsters within the Hollow Earth because Moller, just to put this into context, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Godzilla and Kong had a big old scrap in the previous oh, yeah. movie, and then they teamed up to fight Mecha Godzilla, and then I guess they just went their separate ways. And Kong's now gone into the Hollow Earth, like the world within our world, where he's looking for other Kongs. I don't know if he just oh, yeah. wants to mate or something. And then Godzilla is like, I'm just going to chill on the surface and I'm going to keep those other titans in line. And he's just going around it, actually. It's like it's right toward the beginning of the film when all this, because all this has to be explained to you in the most hackneyed over exposition imaginable because it's a Godzilla yeah. film. And that's just what we do oh, now. Yeah. Um, but like, what's her name from the previous film is giving, a, she's doing a news interview. And um, I just call she's, Rebecca Hall. I can't yeah, remember Rebecca the Hall's character's name. Or whatever the hell. Uh, like uh, Eileen, I think her name's Eileen, <laughs> something like that. But Eileen, she's yeah. giving this, this news interview where she's explaining all of this for the audience. And, and like you see these news clips of Godzilla fighting monsters in the middle of big cities and this like skyscrapers being knocked over, everyone's dying. And she says, But there's nothing to worry about so long as Kong stays down. <laughs> I remember I, I that <laughs> line just slept out of me is so amazing. <laughs> yeah, because like you say, insane. they're fucking flattening <laughs> cities, and she's like, Well, as long as Kong stays below the ground and they don't interact, this is we've totally got fine. To exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing to worry about going on here. Poor Rome. I mean, they but, go after like all the major, major, like beautiful cities, or like, you know, just even the next one. I think the next one they destroy is Cairo. Then it's like yeah, well, the they pyramids just, like, get destroyed and just flattened. But what what's funny is like Godzilla seems to like take a liking to Rome and like because you know how normally when he goes someplace he just kind of walks through everything like nothing really presents an obstacle for him. So there's like a bunch of skyscrapers in my path. Fuck it, I'll just walk right through them. But for some reason he like steps really carefully over the Colosseum and then just curls up and falls yeah. asleep inside it like it's a a dog bed. <laughs> It's like a cat, and, very cat-esque, yeah. I, and I was, I just was baffled as to what they were going for there, <laughs> but maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, just to be cute, like a like a kitty curling up inside a little bed or something like that. It was just an attempt to make him could, cute. I did you have a very existential dread of living in Rome when he's there because it's like, <laughs> you know well, what? he's asleep right now, but like at some point he's going to wake up and fucking destroy everything around him. It's interesting the way you said you had a weird experience because it was the same with me. I didn't mind the giant monkey riding an ice, 
an ice dinosaur and wheezing his axe and doing war cries. That was that was great. I laughed out loud at that. What got me, what I thought was bizarre, was like little things. So um, when uh, Godzilla starts running through the the river in Rome and, and he's destroying all the Rome bridges and you see the cars falling off the bridges, yeah. I'm thinking, wait a minute, surely those roads would have been closed because there would have been a fear that this would happen, but no, people just Rome go about would have been business. evacuated. Yeah. <laughs> people are just going about their business despite, despite the fact that there's a giant dinosaur in their city and you know he's threatening to destroy the place. No, it's people basically just, a like, nuclear weapon on feet, like just yeah, moving but around. You would yeah. think- because it's like uh, the humans, at the very least, would say, "Okay, he's unconscious now because he's taking a nap inside the Colosseum. This is probably our chance to, I don't know, inject him with fucking bleach or, or like try and kill him somehow with poison or um, sedate him. I don't know what it might be, but something to neutralize him. Because whether or not he's potentially a protector for us, he's also a massive force of destruction. Just getting from place to place, he cannot be allowed to continue." Um, just, but they seem pretty chill about the whole thing. It's weird. It feels like such a great summary of what we do. What you're like, the giant ape is riding the yeah, space fine. ice lizard. But what is the <laughs> government's approach to traffic protocol? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> well, you, you you see these scenes right where he just like Despot says he he wakes up and he decides it's time to go. I have to get to a different place, and so he just walks through bridges and like they're covered with cars, and like hundreds of people are getting killed at that moment with him just walking it's around so like he's not even trying to hurt people but it's not even there's not even a moment where the movie stops to say oh my god like what a loss of life it's just nah. right okay, actually, also, got really got mm, the, there's a bit when they go to brazil uh, yeah brazil right at the end and you know that they're going to all die because there's a nice little panning shot of the christo redemptor statue and he's like yeah everyone's about to die they actually use presumably fully populated skyscrapers as like spears so it's like there are no consequences to the action in, in this movie at all. Like thousands of people die all the time. There's probably a massive refugee crisis because they all get kicked out of their cities by these massive monsters. But to quote Rebecca Hall, nothing to worry about. It is all fine. This is just good. This is how the world is now. Nothing to be concerned about at all. <laughs> so to, just to give you a briefest, the briefest of plot summaries more, like mm. this is really Kong's story. Like Godzilla's in it, yeah, but like, there's not really mm. much going on from a narrative point of view for him. You know, he doesn't have much character arc here. Mm. Um, but Kong's in the Hollow Earth. He's looking for other apes. He finds them, but it turns out it's a tribe of apes run by like a big evil ape that tried <laughs> to take over the world with an ice dinosaur. Damn it. Um, like, you know, set, like, millennia before, wasn't it? Like, it's it's this thing is thousands of years old, but Godzilla kicked his ass, so he's been residing in the, inside the Earth. And um, Just he, to interrupt you very quickly there, because you might be wondering, well, if Godzilla kicked this guy's ass, why isn't him why isn't he dead, dead. <laughs> yep because that's a sensible question well it turns out that in this film godzilla has a basic understanding of things like geopolitics and the concept of monarchy right. because he recognizes that the evil ape is a king so rather than kill him and and make his people very sad he imprisons them all in mordor where they can't leave except of course that they can leave because they do leave frequently but they are definitely imprisoned there which is why they haven't left yet at the same time as they have it, so yeah. yeah, and so they're down there. They've also enslaved an ice dinosaur thing that can shoot blasts of like ice age at people. Um, and so he can he can like freeze Kong's entire arm at one point. But anyway, so Kong meets him, he gets his ass kicked by like the, the evil monkey thing and the ice dinosaur, and then runs away. And mm-hmm. yeah. he knows that he's gonna need help because this this evil monkey thing's decided it's time to go back to the surface and and conquer the earth and so he goes up there to get godzilla to help him out and then they have a fight but then there's like this little girl who's like telepathic Mm -hmm. and she's like the last of the people from skull island and so she awakens mothra who then goes up to the surface and then the two of them collectively manage to convince godzilla and kong that they have to work together and stop fighting each other and then they all fight the giant monkey thing and they free the ice dinosaur and it freezes the monkey thing and it breaks up like fucking Simon Phoenix at the end of Demolition Man. They do right. fight it in zero gravity as well because there's a race of like quantum verse Indians down in Hollow Earth I and they have things. pyramids that control gravity. <laughs> their great, <laughs> their great plan is rem- we'll use the gravity pyramids to reverse gravity so no one can get through the sky portals to the real world. Of even course. though Kong's already done that, so that doesn't that's not how it works. But never mind. We'll do that. And then then so they all fight in zero gravity and they fly around and then they end up back in Earth anyway. 
Um, Kong loses his axe at one point, but then Diddy Kong, who was in this movie, grabs the axe and he smashes the crystal. The crystal controls Ice Dinosaur, and because it's so massively important, obviously the villain puts it in the end of his primary weapon, so of course it snaps and he loses his mind control crystal. And then the dinosaur freezes him and then he gets smashed. And then they do three sky beams, I think it is. There's three sky lasers in the yeah. space of about five minutes. Um, right. And then like they go back and live happily ever after. And like the entire city of Rio de Janeiro, with its six million people, is destroyed. But it doesn't matter because it's fine. Well, one. It gets frozen, but then Godzilla unfreezes it with his atomic breath. Um, which is definitely a thing that you could yeah. do. I would trust him to like like reheat my food and stuff. But anyway, um, yeah, there, there came a point towards the end of this movie where I, it, it's like the logical part of your brain that tries to like piece together what you're seeing into a logical chain of events gave <clears> up. <throat> like that that part of my brain just shut down and said, I got nothing. <laughs> Let's just go with it. And so, the, but from that point on, it was a wild ride, man, because I could just enjoy, enjoy. The, the stupid monsters punching each other. But. My my favorite part was when when Kong comes off worse for wear. He has he ha takes damage to his arm, and they realize that. And then immediately they have a solution. They have this a giant robotic, robot. yeah, giant what, arm ready to go, that, um, ready to deploy. In, they just had it in the shed. Yeah, they just kept it in the shed, yeah, ready, just no in case, because the funding for it was almost completed, and then we left it down here. Uh, because no one needed it, and then oh, by by the way, it also has green goo in it that can cure frostbite because that's what we need to happen Instantly. in this one scene. Yeah. So uh, oh, that's a special moment in the film. It's one of my favorite parts. And the, I think I my wrote... favorite bit was like you know how you mentioned Diddy Kong. He's basically like a little baby giant monkey. There's one point where Kong grabs him and uses him as a fucking club <laughs> to like oh, hit yeah. other other evil no, monkeys. No. <laughs> there was there was a genuinely great part. There's these I think there's three or four evil monkeys chasing after King Kong, and he tries to trap them by getting them to cross a trip wire, which will cause rock to fall on top of them. But they're too smart and they don't cross the trip wire. They see it, but then Diddy Kong or you know Baby Kong he appears on the cliffs above them and just pushes the rocks onto them. And then one of the evil monkeys grabs another one and uses him as a like, like a human a shield, shield, a monkey shield. I laughed out loud at that. That was brilliant. That that was a genuinely <laughs> lovely visual touch. Thought that was wonderful. It visually communicated how evil and selfish these monkeys are without saying anything. That was nice. There is some enjoyable stuff in the movie. I mean, I was I, I, on a very superficial level. I think honestly, you you could have had a better film if you just cut the humans out of it altogether and just concentrated <laughs> on all these stupid monsters yeah. having the most basic I, of interactions. I have a question um, for the panel: Did any, on a scale of one to ten, did any, did anybody here reach a one on how much you care about any of the human characters? No, uh, not one nope. bit. And I think it was almost it it was almost designed that way. I think yeah. they were just there to expose it when they needed to and advance the plot in whatever way. Uh, and that was it because none of them had even a lick of personality. They, none of them had an arc really to speak of. They oh, weren't. No, no, you missed the most important one. It's the thematic point that links little Indian kid with Kong. Is that she is the last of her tribe, and so is he. So Aww. she needs to find her family, and so does he. And at the end, she finds her family, who she was already with, because it's Eileen. And then he finds his family of, of evil apes in Mordor. And th there's, a, there's a massive dramatic it's, resolution in this. It's thing. the friends we make along the way, isn't it? <laughs> That's <laughs> really our family. I, I think her like expression that. each time was just the same, which is just this intense concern for Kong. She would just be like, they would like pan to her, and she's just looking like this at Kong the whole time. She's like, and yeah. that's it. That was it. That was the whole thing to her. I mean, she's she's deaf, so she's using sign language, and so she marked a lot of ticked a lot of boxes for the DEI requirement for this movie. So that was good. Definitely, I approve. I thought it was very othering. The, I mean, not to get political about it or anything, but Kong, it, it's genuinely tragic. He's the last of his species, right? He can't even find another ape to just chill out with, never mind a, a woman or a female to reproduce with. But this little Indian girl, okay, so she's the last member of her tribe, but she's still human. She's still got a family. She's still got friends. And I, I understood that the movie was trying to draw that parallel, but it didn't work for me at all because it's like, well, okay, she's the last Indian, but she's fine. She's healthy. She's going to school. She's got a, she has a loving mother who's adopted yeah, her. It, yeah. These are not uh, comparable. Yeah. It's, it's not like the Omega Man where it's just a man I, and, and he's on his own and there's no one. I was just pleased that like this girl could act. 
to some extent. Like she could emote, like baggage claim says she had facial expressions that she could convey. She could convey emotions wow. just by it looking at things. These days. And I, I just I thought I'm gonna because you know, my other experience of this sort of thing recently was um was it Alaqua, whatever her name is in Alaqua um, Cox. Alaqua Cox in, in Echo. Uh, who was just like Ooh. someone it was like someone drew a face onto just a, a, a dinner plate or something like she had no facial expressions and i thought oh is that is that a result of you know <laughs> some disability or something it's like is that what you have to do when you're doing sign language no it's not actually you got this girl who can emote and give you something um so yeah maybe just alacqua cox is a shit actress then i guess oh, could well. be I mean, it was also her first job. She'd never. She. I, I think she's not even a trained actress, if I'm not mistaken. She's just. They just plucked her. Okay. Out. Yeah. She did okay for. I mean, the, the script doesn't give her a whole lot to work with, but. Right. Um, did you guys enjoy the subplot as well about Kong having a toothache? I was just about to ask: Can anyone make sense of this? Because I've, I'm like, I've still no. My script is done. The video will be out this weekend, but I'm still trying to figure out what the hell the tooth thing was. So he. He he kills the evil man bear pig creatures. He tries to have lunch on one of them, and like he chips a tooth and it gets infected. And then some lizard goober thing steals his lunch, so he's having a really bad day. And then <laughs> he, the, he like goes Kong back. straight up does like he looks at the camera and almost goes, <sighs> <laughs> "Yeah, he's, like, he's having what a really day. tough time." Poor old Kong. We're we're gonna feel sorry for him. But then he he goes up into our world to get his tooth fixed by the, the one this incredibly insufferable man in a Hawaiian shirt who mm. is just. Uh, yeah, anyway. You got um, a problem so with the, Hawaiian shirts, Platoon. I, I do, Ooh. yes. It's tough with people in Hawaiian shirts. Yeah, it also yeah, just so. didn't make sense that it was a British man in a Hawaiian shirt. That just didn't work for me. The, the, the thing that the drinker missed is that drinker didn't begin this stream by singing I gotcha. Um, that, that would have <laughs> yeah. made that would have made you peak insufferable Hawaiian I just was wondering there if Baggage Claim was like, British people aren't real. Why have they put that <laughs> in this movie? No, I Welsh expect people. better of British people than to succumb to to Hawaiian shirts. That's all. Well, then you have too high an expectation of me, Malia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this guy, it's like, again, I said this in my review, you could take each of the characters in this movie, the human characters, and give them like one word and that would basically be enough to define their entire personality. And in his case, it would just be like oddball. You know, he's the oddball mm. guy who wears a Hawaiian shirt and he doesn't take anything mm. seriously and he's kind of wacky. He, and, he can yeah. perform he dental surgery bad. on Kong using a spaceship and this means that he is a, an expert botanist when it comes to super fauna. So he's their guide when they get down into the hollow earth, which he, he knows all about um, and he's friends with all the animals. But I like the two thing is just really bugging me because I do not have a clue why it's in the movie. He goes up, he gets the tooth replaced by a metal one. I think there's a line about it being able to bite through anything, but that never yeah. happens again. And actually Godzilla bites through the villain's whip thing later, which I think Kong was maybe meant to do, but he didn't. So the tooth, and they keep calling back to it as well because like Kong goes down and meets the Scar King, who's the evil ape. And the first thing the Scar King does is walk up to Kong and put his finger in his yeah. mouth. And I'm thinking, well... That's a bit kinky and weird. Well, they, they I wouldn't let someone pay... do that to me on my first meeting. But why are you laughing at his metal tooth? I don't understand what's happening. Well, Platoon, you don't understand the, the cosmic symmetry of this because they pay it off later when uh, the, the evil monkey thing gets his tooth knocked out and then Kong just kind of <laughs> looks at him and goes, huh. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I honestly think that was the extent of their thought process on this one. <laughs> They also Amazing. needed an excuse for Kong to go to the surface, and they needed an excuse to show how the humans are useful to Kong and how Kong and the humans have a kind of symbiotic relationship. So I just thought of that. That was their excuse. Give him a toothache, and that'll get him to the surface, and then we can have a cool scene where a guy comes in and uses mm. some industrial piece of equipment to tear his tooth out. Just, a, just an excuse to get him up there. I think there is. Um, there's one incredibly meta line though, which I very much enjoyed, which is when so they can they, the Scar King and his evil ape army is approaching Quantum Indian Tron World Land because this is bad, and they're explaining their plan with the gravity pyramids to try and stop him. Okay, and it's obviously insane, what? right? But then a Hawaiian shirt guy says, "Oh yeah, while we're throwing shit at the wall, I also yeah. have a plan." <laughs> It's like yeah, the film knows what it's doing. The film knows that this is how it's being written. People are just throwing shit at a piece of paper and they run with whatever yeah. sticks. So what saw... you guys are doing, hollow earth gravity pyramids with tooth surgery. What the fuck is this movie? <laughs> like, what? You need to watch it. You've missed it. I know. Out. It's something like I just... don't need to watch. <laughs> I, I want to know. It's not even a film in the normal sense, it's an experience. Like, this Am movie, I over. This... 
am I overthinking the meta on this? Because there's a point where they go into the jungle and there's this Scottish guy and the, and it's it's that total trope, right? Where you've mm. got it's, it's always a white man and he's he's saying like I'm running this operation. Everybody look at me. Listen to me. I don't you talk when I'm talking. And then a flower or a plant just eats him in one go. Yeah. And then two of the guys sort of say, well, that just happened. And then they hug and then they never mention him again and just walk on and forget about it. And I thought, <laughs> is this the movie being meta and saying, look, we know you don't give a shit about the human characters. You care about them so little that we can just have one of them being eaten by a plant on screen and no one cares and you don't care and, and they hug and we move on. I is mean, that he... them being meta or is it just a funny visual gag for them? It, it's a gag. And like that guy was just a red shirt. Like, he yeah. was the only guy who didn't have a character of, like, you know, intro or anything like that. He's just, like, guy who helps them out. And, like, you know, the moment he starts acting like an asshole, uh, he gets eaten. And it's so funny as well because, you know, when you talk about just the basic elements of filmmaking, like, you show a reaction shot of something and it's like, okay, that's going to be significant later. Like, he gets eaten, but then his gun gets spat out and dropped on the ground. And there's mm -hmm. a really, like, the camera lingers on it for a good couple of seconds. Like, oh, this gun's lying there. It's been established as a thing which is now there. It'll probably get referenced again at some point. Someone will pick it up and use it. Never does. Nope. Never he's gets referenced. Like, he's Why the only are you showing sensible us character. This? Like, his, his, his being sensible guarantees he has to die because this film views being sensible as being the enemy. But, like, he's in, like there's this scene when they're walking through the jungle in Hollow Earth and he's being bitten to hell by mosquitoes, and he keeps slapping them away. Meanwhile, Hawaiian shirt hippie guy is letting mosquitoes bite him because it gets like all they're doing is feeding their eggs. You should be in touch with nature. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, yeah. but you've got malaria now, and it's probably really bad <laughs> malaria because everything down here is giant. Nature is not your friend, kids. This is not the lesson you're supposed to be taking away. Yeah, that yeah. was funny. His, his line was, oh, she probably needs the blood more than I do. And I thought that was, that was really <laughs> interesting. And it's also funny that there's a like a vlogging YouTuber as one of the characters too. He was really insufferable. He's oh, vlogging gosh. the whole experience of being I, being in Hollow Earth. Because Mahler, again, to put this into some sort of context for you, this is a mission uh, into the Hollow Earth, highly dangerous, using highly um, experimental and classified military technology. You know, gateways into the the earth is essentially what they're doing. Um, no guarantee that any of them are going to survive this. They don't know what they're venturing into. Uh, complete nightmare scenario. Uh, they take along a fucking YouTuber and a 12-year-old <laughs> child with them. Just because, <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? It's <laughs> just, okay, sure. Yep. <laughs> it's that kind of movie. Like, nobody questions it. None of the characters care. So, like, why should I? <laughs> Do you think the people who made this think it's shit? I think no. they no, I think they think it's fun. In but fact, the they... audience it's response has been very positive. The audience response, because I looked at it, I looked at all a lot of the comments on Drinker's video and on Rotten Tomatoes and uh Movie Cynic made a video about it in which he said it was dumb <laughs> and shit, and he got crucified in the comments. Yeah, really? he gets death threats Brutal even ratio. now. Many, many death and threats on that video. I, I just what? thought, Jesus, this is bizarre because I saw a movie which was superficially entertaining, absolutely absurd, doesn't make sense on a lot of levels. It has underground Wakanda people who dress in loincloths but simultaneously have anti gravity technology. <laughs> it's just, it's absurd. It's crazy. It doesn't make any sense, and it has about a billion plot holes. But people love it the audience reaction has been really positive and the human characters are terrible they're shite and i get it i get it's fun but it's not good fun it's it's dumb you see, what, what, what you don't understand is that it's a film with giant monsters and it's a blockbuster right and that means it has to be dumb this is the argument that people genuinely make in defense of this sort of thing jurassic park dumb jaws dumb it's basically the same <laughs> as the meg to the trench it's the same thing all blockbusters are dumb so why are you being critical of it let us have fun stop it's stopping us from having fun god damn it <laughs> i i think um you know i saw one of the comments that stuck out in my video was like um if you're a godzilla fan right you can you can appreciate the the more intelligent um thoughtful approach of something like minus one where it's essentially a, a character driven human drama with the backdrop of a fucking giant lizard destroying half the the country okay that's one aspect of it or you can also enjoy just a dumb monster movie where like you've got giant monsters fighting each other and punching each other and like some superficial pretense of a human story uh in the background of that and it doesn't make any sense and it's dumb fun 
both of those aspects can work. It just depends what you're in the mood for. And I thought, yeah, okay, that's that's a fair enough way of summarizing what this is. Um, it's it's just a different take on this monster movie genre. I mean, I know which movie I prefer. I know which one I consider a far well, better film. But I, I can no still. One's, no one's saying you can't enjoy it, right? Well, that's the thing. Like, yeah, I I had a weird sense of enjoyment just from watching this. Once I put a cordless drill into my head for a few seconds and just <laughs> you know let it do its thing, I was fine and I thought it was great fun. Um, but yeah, there's no pretense that this is an intelligent movie or that has even a rational story to tell. It doesn't care about that. It's not even trying to do that. And I think once you achieve that that level of, of self-awareness, once you realize, yeah, we know exactly what we're making for people. I don't know. Maybe there's a kind of equilibrium that you reach with this where you just accept it for what it is. Um, the Meaning best thing what, I though, that's good. That, that was the bizarre thing, though, because what I was seeing in the comments, it wasn't acceptance. I could, I could understand acceptance. People saying, yeah, it was fun. It was a fun, dumb movie. It sells movie tickets. It sells popcorn, whatever. No, like it was passionate defense. Like people love this movie. <laughs> I don't know then. That is so but, strange. It was especially after Godzilla minus one just came out not so long ago and proved that you could go watch a movie like that that also had substance and was well made and with passion and love and like it was a great product. I don't know why then people are clinging to such, you know, dribble. <laughs> well, I, I just I just want to make sure everyone's language is clear. It's like yeah, enjoy it the as much as you want. It's a real pretty shit story though. If someone said, like, no, it's not, because I enjoyed it, I'd be like, oh, well, but I enjoy loads of shit stories. <laughs> I, I think if you go into this for the story, you're you're going to be <laughs> somewhat disappointed, I think. If you go into it just for the visual spectacle of watching monsters, like, fucking suplex each other over the pyramids, uh, you're probably going to get a lot of fun out of it. And I think that's the essence of what this movie's going for. Yeah, I figure yeah, as long as everyone's agreed on that, then yeah. <laughs> like, no, need, no need for death threats on Movie Cynic or anything. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and that's the thing. Like, God, the, the guy's just being fair and honest, I guess, on his opinion. Like, I can't imagine getting that worked up about uh, Godzilla and Kong. <laughs> like, but people do get very defensive. Me. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, Jurassic World Dominion was kind of the same. And, you know, you, you point out that this film is just absolute garbage. And you will get lots of people in, usually with, like, dinosaurs as their profile pictures, admittedly. But they'll appear in your <laughs> comment section. And they will say really mean and nasty things about, why can't you just, you know, let us enjoy the monster film? Is it because Jurassic Park was better. Like, no one suffers if you make a good film. Yeah, you can enjoy a deliberately bad film or an accidentally bad film. I had a great time with Madam Web. But I'm not going around telling anyone that it's a good film. I enjoyed it yeah. because it was so terrible. Um, the same thing sort of applies with this movie. But if you actually do care about the monsterverse, if you care about the monsters, kaiju films, also if you think that kids deserve good entertainment because you know kids, this is their formative stage and this is how they learn things, maybe be responsible and take them to see a good film instead of this one. But you don't have to settle for this. You can you can enjoy it for being bad if you want to, or you can enjoy a film that's actually good but also has monsters in it, like plenty of them that do exist in the world. Yeah, I mean, Pacific Rim, is a, Pacific Rim is a decent example of a movie, which is very crazy and over the top, but it's got some very nice human drama. Like one of the main it's characters. Enjoyable. Nice it's enjoyable. Really yeah, enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, totally. I that's that's, that's why what people are looking for in this, but also have it be good as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, really what, that's what I picked up on in my review about this, because I mentioned Pacific Rim, and it's like, this is probably the closest thing that I can equate it to, um, where it's like, Again, just giant monsters, and you substitute our giant robots in for like Kong or whatever. Like, fine, they're just fighting kaiju this time. But that movie was, I guess, more accessible for me because the human drama, the rivalry between the different pilots, the the um, you know the kind of um, backstory to each of them, that was the center of the story. The kaiju were just the the backdrop to it all. And that's why it worked a little better. This one, it's like Kong is essentially the, the main narrative force of this story. And any of the humans that are in it are just there to expose it and just be like dumb background characters. That's, I guess, the difference. And I think that's that's the that's where you can make the argument that it would have been better to just take the humans out of the equation altogether because they're so flimsy and pointless. Like I would just rather see these monsters fighting each other and just um Kong doing almost like a, a Planet of the Apes style, you know, bit of emoting or sign language or something there. That would that would have been fine because yeah, it's, it's kept, so simplistic anyway. 
I kept falling asleep every time they were doing this portions mm -hmm. with the humans and they were talking about the backstory of the people that are indigenous to hollow earth. I, I actually just kept falling asleep. And yeah. I would wake up 10 minutes later when like Kong makes some loud noise and I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> we're, we're here still. Okay, let's go. Because those segments go on for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Like the bits with the mm -hmm. fucking crystal pyramids and like all the, the you know, talking about the, the super advanced, um, you know, civilization living beneath the earth who also use spears and don't have any sort of like actual technology, but whatever, like no one cares. But like you know, all those different segments of people walking up like giant crystal staircases and touching things and making energy beams go places. Uh, it goes on for ages. And like you say, um, I watched this quite late, like, like at night, and oh yeah, it was a struggle. It was a struggle to stay awake <laughs> during this space. Do you think maybe there, there's an element of the popcorn effect entering this, whereby you see a movie? You could also kind of call this like the J.J. Abrams effect, whereby you just throw a ton of shit at the screen, and because it's you know flashy and entertaining, um, and it's it's happening so fast that uh, people don't notice how oh, shit the movie oh, actually yeah, is. No, because J.J. Abrams, the, the one thing he's good at is injecting a sense of urgency, I suppose, or like characters have got so much to say and they got to move on to the next thing. They're like, bang, bang, bang. There's like a million the things time. going on. This is much slower. And so that you do actually have a lot of time to chew over like the things that you've seen and, and realize, wow, none of this makes any sense. JJ is able to obfuscate that just by moving on to the next thing much quicker. I suppose yeah. this movie doesn't do yeah, that. That, that, was, that. That third star, that third DST movie. Um, Jesus, that was exactly like that. By the time one scene was over, it's like you're trying to process. It, it's like, wait, what the fuck just happened? And then a million other things are happening before you can even comprehend what just happened. Yeah. What's DST? Uh, Disney Star Wars trilogy. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. That was definitely the case with that. Uh, that it drives me crazy in the third move in the third sequel movie where they know that a beam is gonna destroy a planet in 13 hours and they're still arguing about something really inane, but just really fast. <laughs> it's just guys move on to the laser, yeah. they're more important things. Yeah, I was getting flashes of that is not so much with the human scenes. The human scenes were really boring, but the the monster scenes where there was so much stuff happening so quickly, I, I was getting flashbacks of heard movie i can't what is it what was it called the rise of palpatine right. or something <laughs> yeah i walk close enough pretty much yeah. the same thing um yeah. i guess the the question i was going to ask like because i said this to you more like before if you were to watch the 2014 godzilla movie with brian cranston which is like part of this same chronology um for for the rest of you guys, like which movie is more fun? That movie, which takes itself pretty seriously and tries to tell an actual serious Godzilla story, but then fucking really scrimps out and actually showing you Godzilla doing anything, versus this, which is more fun to watch on just a basic entertainment level? Oh, that's that's a super difficult question because the the thing about that movie is I remember being annoyed when Brian Cranston sort of awkwardly dies, and then we follow. Not even what I consider to be a bad actor these days, but we follow a bad performance throughout the rest of the movie for our main character. And the only thing that interests me was like sort of cinematography choices with Godzilla himself. That was about it. And I didn't come away from the movie thinking, wow, what a legendary performance and amazing experience, blah, blah, blah. Um, Meanwhile, if I was to watch what you guys have been describing with the correct drugs, I feel like it would be the best experience ever. <laughs> yeah. But like, that's a whole different metric to what makes for good storytelling as far as I'm concerned. And I think that, you know, if if not minus one proving it definitively to everybody, it's like Godzilla has huge potential. It doesn't just have to be monsters going blah, 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 and humans being annoying for like an hour and a half. I don't, I don't, I've never understood that part. Listening to you guys talk about any of the human stuff, I'm like, so once again, in this deliberately self-aware, goofy monsters fight each other movie, they waste our time for like more than an hour with war worthless human shit. I Why do they have to do that? They don't also, have to do that. It's worth stressing as well. Like uh, most of the, I think, if not most, maybe half of the monster battles in this movie happen off screen. So like, all the people who say, well, I only go and watch it for the monster battles. Mo like half of them at least happen off screen. There's there's the Kong versus there's a Rayquaza in the movie for some reason. So Kong versus that happens off screen. Godzilla fights a Rayquaza that also happens off screen. I think there's a third one that mostly happens off screen, and then you get a couple of snippets of the monsters and like the news thing at the beginning. 
but then you get just a couple of what you'd call like straight monster action fights and they are basically at the end of the movie so it's not even as though you've got much to distract you like periodically from the bad boringly written human stuff because most of it just gets skipped over so i can't even see that as the defense is like well it's enjoyable because i only paid attention to the monsters fighting great i, I hope you really liked that bit where they cut away from the fight that was a really enjoyable thing to watch I mean, did you did you enjoy like the pyramids getting blasted apart by Godzilla? That was fun. Like breath. Well, I just that was felt really sorry fun. for them. I was like imagining all the poor people in Egypt so that they've grown up with this stuff. It's the one thing they've got to be proud of from their heritage, and it's gone. And like and people in Rio and Rome, also the, the poor people who work at UNESCO World Heritage. Like, the, what's the point of their job anymore? Because everything they love just gets destroyed by some <laughs> anchor of a director. <laughs> like an entire team is like getting ready to do the next excavation and they're like well there it go <laughs> yeah i just got obliterated by godzilla we, we just raised you. five thousand pounds oh, yeah. to clean the floor of the coliseum oh shit Fine. i'll tell you the thing that does annoy me about this movies uh, these movies and it's been there ever since pretty much the first one it's the fact that there's no real sense of weight and size and scale to these monsters, like you're seeing them next to things like the pyramids or the Colosseum or whatever, and you know that they're physically big, but there's no sense of that size and the sheer mass that these animals would be. Um, and by that, I mean like they, they move as fast and agile as we would. If, we, if you just say put us in a, ro a rubber Godzilla suit and said like, right, fight and run around and stuff, that's how quickly they move. There's there's no sense that they are gigantic animals which weigh tens of thousands of tons. And I don't know, man. Like once you lose that sense of scale, it's like it's like just watching Planet of the Apes. Like, for example, the, the bit where Kong is in the Hollow Earth and he's fighting all of the, the other evil apes, they could just as easily be like regular um, you know, human scale, like six feet tall. Like that's how quickly they move. That's how little weight and size they have to them. Which um, which movies are you referring to when you say these ones? I assume you're discounting the Brian Cranston one. Yeah. So basically, from that onwards. Yeah. I'm once you once you get to like King of the Monsters and stuff, like that's that's the the level you're at. They just they run, they jump around, they move really quickly. It just looks so uncanny for the size that they are. That's mm -hmm. I guess one of the things I really liked about Minus One, how slow and lumbering and enormous Godzilla felt. It felt like there was an actual, there was weight behind him, as there should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I was thinking of the... Rocky Four when you were describing that because it, it's an overlooked movie. But one thing they do really well is they communicate like the scale and the and the mass and the power and the weight of Ivan Drago. He's like a monster. It's kind of an overcoming the monster plot, Rocky Four, and. Ivan Drago is more of a monster than a villain. And you feel that the weight, the size of him in the movie, and I know it's a small thing, but a director could look at Rocky IV and think, well, okay, how is, how is the enormity and the size and the power of Ivan Drago being communicated and how can we transplant that to a monster on screen? That kind of idea. Yeah, and I was just going to say that with Godzilla minus one, every time Godzilla was powering up, I don't know if that's the best way to say it, but... Every time he was powering up, there was you it created such a sense of dread because it was that slow build up each time, and you you felt that tension. Whereas with this movie, it was just kind of instantaneous, where you could see him like lighting up and he's about to blow. And I I enjoyed the drama of minus one so much more. And with this with with this one, when they were in Hollow Earth, I almost I forgot about. Kong's size. It felt mm -hmm. like he was just a regular monkey. Or it's regular. also the, the creators also forgot about it. And the Hollow Earth thing, I think, is is probably a big part of that because there's no comparison in Hollow Earth because you're not setting it next to human recognizable objects. You can't get the sense of scale. I actually genuinely think that the creators themselves convinced themselves that Kong and Godzilla are normal size down there because there's a bit when Kong and Diddy Kong walk into Mordor um, and they have to cross a giant bone bridge. Kong is roughly the width of one of the rib bones, and he's smaller than the eye socket of what turns out to be the skeleton of a giant monster, which is being used as a bridge. And I'm thinking, well, oh, but that thing must be the size of about four cities. What the hell was that? <laughs> how, how did that get there? Who killed it? Like, and Godzilla, as, as has been established in the lore dump, Godzilla wins all of the battles throughout history, so who killed this thing? None of it makes any sense. It's just there to look good. 
That's all they've yeah, done. Godzilla for. shot him with a gun. <laughs> a pistol. At this point, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> he used the, the gravity the... pyramid on it to fucking squash it or <laughs> something. I don't know. Even on the human world, though, the scale's not really there. You don't really feel the weight. They just look. They look like people in kind of in suits playing in a in a in a playpen. It's not. It doesn't feel weighty and big. What, like in Pacific what do you women, say to the people who say that's fun and referencing? You know the old. I'd say watch, watch Pacific Rim. That's fun, like because you really feel the weight and the power of the Jaegers and the Kaiju's, and and it's not because they're slow and ponderous. It's also because of the, the way the the camera's positioned, like it's positioned low, looking up. That gives them a sense of enormity, for example. And um, the the sound, the sound really matters with those movies. And Pacific Rim has a it has a great sound design because you can really feel the 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 action scenes through the well, audio. Yeah, yeah. The audio but is it, essential. It, Whereas the audio like I felt you... Godzilla vs. Kong was kind of, it was a bit flatter and a bit more generic. If someone was arguing to you that they were trying to evoke the sense of the uh, Toho stuff, you know? I, like I'm the... not, I'm, I don't know the MonsterVerse well enough to know what they're talking about. I'm very much a tourist in the MonsterVerse. Yeah, no, well, because that seems to be a lot of the time where a lot of people go with this conversation. They're like, how familiar are you? And you're like, I'm just, okay, I'm just saying this new one was shitty, right? <laughs> Don't be too upset, anybody. They also say, like, oh, but the old ones are silly and corny as well. I said, yeah, because they were made for about $5. <laughs> That's a big impact as well. well like, yeah, I mean, like, and the original one wasn't. It was taken pretty seriously. And that's the one that's, like, remained iconic. That's the one that's so well regarded. It, it devolved into farce as the, the monster verse progressed because, like you say, they had low budgets. And I guess they sort of run out of ideas of how, how can we keep this a serious threat? You know, they just kind of devolved into just comedy and and silliness. Um, but and no, a lot nobody of the Marvel really... humor also. That that was the other thing. It was like rife with oh that God, Marvel that style bloody... jokes. You're talking about the black character, the guy yes. who was there to be the side character who makes you know funny quips, and he says, "Oh my God, that just happened," and he pulls yeah. funny faces, and he's like, "You know, I cannot believe that that actually happened." Oh uh, yeah, it, oh. it's just so tropey. Yeah, every everyone, it, there, it's just yeah, a plethora of just very unserious characters all the time. And like like Drinker was saying to Mahler that you know this was a serious mission, and you have on it a YouTube vlogger, you have this <laughs> child, you have this just it's just very, and then this man who's who's like a botanist slash vet, and he's just along for the ride, just to point out the various flora and fauna along the way. It's amazing that we've you know. We've been talking about this for like 50 minutes, like the, the <laughs> dumbest movie in the history of cinema. And like, we've got all this time out of anal out, like analyzing it. It is what? impressive. I'll say that. Lots of very, very sad and upset people that we're attacking their favorite monsters. It's, we're uh... not attacking. We're playfully <laughs> ribbing it. Okay. I thought someone say it. It's like, sounds like you guys are annoyed that people had fun with it. It's like, sounds like I would have fun with it. I don't know what you mean. Like, it's, it's just, <laughs> I draw a line between enjoying things and considering them well executed in their craft. All right. Two different things. Yeah, I, I think we can all say, and I speak for the panel on this one, we heartily recommend that you watch this one more. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll get around to take, it. Why not? Take all the drugs before doing so, and you will have the time of your life. Yes, sir. I might invite and live you. live tweet it. <laughs> we'll do a yeah. few movies for it. Uh, no, I'd love to see it. Shall we, shall we move on to something slightly more serious, though? Slightly. Because... Slightly, yes. Um, the the first trailer for Joker two, and more. You might have to fill, help me with the pronunciation of this one. Filet adieu. Why would you go for me instead of little platoon? Oh, oh, either I, of you, I, really. Yeah, like, you're you my co-host. That's your job. French. I can't speak French. <laughs> I think it's filet adieu. Yeah, filet adieu. Not filet. There's no accent. It's filet, okay. isn't it? Filet adieu. It's filet of fish, guys. Listen, I ain't French. <laughs> yeah. okay. I'll pronounce it the Welsh way. <laughs> <laughs> Just dump a bunch of fucking barrels onto the, the page and away you go. Um, I was going to show you the trailer, but I, I can't do the audio because uh, it's essentially like one giant licensed soundtrack, so I can't really do that. But uh, I'll just bring it up so I can skip to the you know various parts of still images. But I assume we all had the chance to see it um, over the past couple of days, mm -hmm. and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it. I suppose um, I'll bring it up just so I can like can reference bits that you want to talk about. I suppose. Oh, 
I'm not going to play it right now, so you feel free to <laughs> feel free to talk away. Well, I'm just, I can just skip to wherever you want to go. Could, we can start at. I assume everyone agreed we shouldn't be getting a sequel for this film. That seemed to be a talking point that most people were on board with. However, I was on board with that one, yes. if it's going to get one, you want the same team that made the first one to be making it because I'm not interested at all. If you remove Joaquin Phoenix or Todd Phillips at this point, or the um. Is it Hilda Gunadatta or something? Is she just the soundtrack? I want her in as well. I want I want everyone back, right? That's what I assume. If this one does well, if they do a third one and Todd Phillips leaves, it'll be like, nah, about Because <laughs> like, they have a, a way of telling this story, and if the people who told the first one are telling more of it, I'm more interested in giving it a shot. But I'm, I'm of the camp, and I think everyone was, that uh, the first one was one and done. It was really solid. I don't see why you need to continue. But that's Earth for you, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are a billion reasons why they made a second one, but the question is, do you think that this one will be commercially successful? Certainly yes. not as commercially successful. I don't think it'll be as as blow away as the first one, but I can see this one working out. I I could see this actually being more more successful than the three. I I I wouldn't be surprised. I don't. I almost don't want it to, but I think it might because I think the hype around it is going to be fucking huge. Um, I, I think the the first one made such an impact, and I don't know, man. There just seems to be a lot of like, there seems to be a lot of buzz. There seems to be a lot of interest around this. It just feels like something that's going to be a big deal. Um. Okay. Well, I mean, I'll just put it out there. I assume the fact that it's a musical is going to hold it back somewhat. Not like destroy it or anything, but I just uh, general audiences. Uh, I, I imagine there's not going to be as many repeat viewings for musicals. <sighs> Who knows? Again, like it feels like with this one, anything could happen. Like I, when you, when I first heard about this, one that they were going to be doing a sequel to Joker, I didn't like the idea, and two that it was going to be a musical. Uh, oh, and then three, it was going to have Lady Gaga in it. It just seemed like a recipe for absolute disaster. And then I saw this trailer and I thought, actually... Wait, help me out. What's that based on? Do you Is it because of things Lady Gaga says in real life? Are you basing that on things you've seen her in before? No, I'm basing it on the fact that she's a fucking pop star and she's not like an actor necessarily you, like i know she's not I know, just become an actor she's been acting for a while now i know and i know she was in oh that thing with bradley cooper what the fuck was that called again um star, star is, is born, born. Yes. Yeah. of gucci that's I know it right she, those are the two she's done yeah she, i know she, she she's an american act. horror story as well oh. yeah but i guess the the idea of casting her in something like this she still feels like a bit of a gimmick uh and so that put me off you know, she, if I was to class her like compared to something, well, compared to Joaquin Phoenix, I do not consider them to be in the same league in terms of experience and acting chops. I don't think anyone's and making I, that claim, though. I just, uh, no. if I, I, I have any reason to think that she might actually be one of the best suited people for this role. I want someone who can sing. And if we can get someone who can act, that would be wonderful, too, as far as I wish oh. you can. Come on, it doesn't matter if they can actually sing. You can fucking auto tune people to within an inch of their life. Like, they're actual well, singing. I don't singing fucking want auto tune matter. in my music. Well, no one does. Like, you're you're saying, like, it, it could be done. You just have some not, standards. You're going to get it. Everything oh, is auto tune now. Even no, stuff of where you don't hear it, it everything is auto tune now. That's why when you go back and you listen to. A great experiment is to like take a, a teenager or somebody in their early twenties and play them music from the nineties that doesn't have any auto tune on it, and a lot of the time they think it's a bad vocal because they've been raised with this disgusting stylized auto tune shite. Everything gets auto tuned now. Yeah, everything's going to be uh, meddled with in post for sure. But like the her raw ability as a singer is going to be fucking leagues ahead of the vast oh, majority yeah, of actresses. Well, yeah, for sure. I guess if I was to choose though, like film being primarily a visual medium that requires acting ability, I would pick an actor over a singer any day of the week. I would rather have an actor that could deliver a stunning performance and maybe their vocals aren't quite there, but we can fix that with auto-tune mm. versus... But the thing is, you have no idea what she's capable of as an actress. Well, I, I know. I 100% I agree. And I was simply like explaining my rationale when I first heard about all this stuff. That, that, that was where my initial thoughts were. But having seen the trailer, okay, I'm, I'm interested. I'm willing to give this a chance and go into it with an open mind. 
I, I, I would recommend you check it. out A Star Is Born if you want to have an idea of what she's capable of. I've seen it, and yeah, well, wait, she's wait, good. What? But yeah, she is good. But that's one movie. I just, well, but all you need to know is that she's capable, which now we know, right? Sure. Yeah. I guess I'm always <laughs> just I, I I'm always going to have this issue with someone who started off as a pop star and then transitioned into acting, and okay, they they might have had say a good performance in one film, which is great, but it doesn't change the fact that they're not necessarily an actor by trade. They they have moved into that. Um and it just I guess it created that uh that association in my mind. You know, you, I'm sure we've we've seen plenty of movies where you have people from other fields that have tried to get into acting and it hasn't always ended well. There is always it's a slight good. suspicion, isn't there, that the motive is maybe not as pure as it might be. I remember when, um, is it Harry Styles found his way into Dunkirk somehow? Yeah. Um, that was a strange think, like, one. That was a very strange one. Now, well, yeah, he doesn't Ed have Sheeran too much and, uh, to do. Game Ed Sheeran and Game of Thrones is a really good example. Yeah, I should have picked that one. Um, th- th- there's always like the suspicion, okay, if you're changing genre massively toward a musical and you're bringing in a, a well-known, popular female artist who is pro- predominantly a singer, I'm not saying she can't act, I, I've not seen her in anything, so... I can't judge, but there's probably the suspicion that the motive is this is a way to expand your audience in a direction more than it necessarily is a reflection of casting on talent is a fair suspicion, I'd say, but the proof will only be in what we get as a result. I am basically allergic to musicals, though, so whether I even get through the door to see this one, I don't know. Yeah, and I'm I'm wondering, because I think the first Joker, you guys can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I feel like it didn't really attract much of a female audience and i'm curious if this one will because first of all it's a musical but also there's this female interest in trauma bonded relationships hence the vast success that twilight saw and then there was also this like whole subset of the internet that was obsessed with the suicide squad because of the trauma bonded relationship between the joker and um, Margot Robbie's character. Aren't they the, the, the commonality <laughs> though? Isn't yeah. they, aren't they usually quite attractive though? Like, I can't see anyone looking at Joaquin yeah. Phoenix as the joke and saying, I can fix him. That's what I'm yeah, wondering. It's like, I, I don't want to fix him. Like, a plastic surgeon has to fix him. <laughs> it's not like Fifty Shades of Grey where both of them are really attractive. It's not quite that. But I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm really curious if like suddenly a lot more women are going to be interested in this, mm. in this movie. I th- you know I think that's a fair cop like if if they're generally more invested in relationship dramas and that sort of thing like the dynamics between two people maybe they're going to get more bought into this one um yeah I don't know what the demographics were for the the original Joker whether it was a predominantly male led um, audience or what yeah I mean um, I anecdotally it was only the men in my life that were interested in going and watching it I didn't hear any of the women but that's just purely anecdotal the thing for me is I don't really care about her music at all and I'm what I mean by that is like I she, that hasn't affected my view of her that much in fact I knew barely anything about her so seeing her in uh, a star is born I was like oh lady gaga and like oh this is obviously uh, bringing her in for popularity, right? And then you watch it, and you're like, oh, shit, okay, she's like, mm, fair enough. <laughs> like, you can pull off some seeds that are pretty difficult here. Um, and so now seeing this, I'm just like, oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. You br- bring someone in who can bring in an audience her own, but then she's also able to sing, also able to act, and the role is going to be in a musical. She's also kind of weird. So... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, sure. Yeah. Like, crazy? So, I, I don't know. Like, to me, it just seems like one of the most obvious choices. Um, but we'll see for sure. Like it could be a could end up being a bad choice. We want an unhinged psychopath. Yes, the natural choice is Lady Gaga will pick her. She will <laughs> yeah, repress yeah. her. Dead. Yeah. Well, because Joaquin Phoenix does a lot of fucking out of the, out, out there roles, you know? Like uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I don't know. We'll have to s- see on that. Um this this film though, uh as, as I don't know if you guys have seen the discourse, but like the, the final shot of it, if you can grab it up there, drink it. Got a lot of praise. And then, as counterculture does, it got a shit ton of criticism soon after. Like, so it went from people saying, like, this is a wonderful shot, what an amazing job, and it has so much you can dig out of it for meaning, and can't wait to see the context of it in the film. 
And that I think lasted about a day. And then people were like, have you never seen films before? Oh, <laughs> yeah. little baby appreciated their first ever movie. And it's like, oh shit. You need to improve your media diet. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, it, it's just going to be a repeat of what happened with the first Joker, which is uh, a lot of people got very angry that people were appreciating it so much when it's like, you should be talking about how it's a ripoff of Taxi Driver. You should be talking yeah, about how it's a king of comedy. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, and so you, I would call them the film bros, not even doing that derogatorily. I've been known to dabble in film bro culture. <laughs> <either. laughs> uh, you know, the, it's unfortunate that we can't say, like, it's really cool, the influences that are in the film and what we've done as an adaptation of a different thing, combining elements of this and this and making this, and that Todd Phillips has grown from what we all see as, like, oh, he, he does bona comedies or... Um, just, just sort of things that we don't really care about, but kind of like appreciate and laugh at. He's made a serious film that regards a lot of topics that are quite, uh, you've got to be careful about how you approach them in modern day. And his film got shat on by media for being one that's going to create shooters and stuff. And yet it persevered. Box office, obviously, Oscars, and just general appreciation from critics. And now it's getting its sequel, which to me, I just feel like, oh God, are we getting, uh, are we getting a round two? Is that what's going to happen? I feel like there is there's this antagonism towards the first Joker movie, and it was almost like I don't know, man. I, I hate to bring the meta of politics and crap into it, but it's inescapable in some cases where I can't shake the notion that they were angry that you had a a movie that dared to suggest that a straight white male lead might have problems in life and might be abandoned by society and might actually be someone who is deserving of pity and that there's an interesting story to tell about a person like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was elements within the media and within within contemporary culture that just got real mad that uh, general audiences really got behind a character like that. I mean, there were some absolutely crazy takes from what I recalled at the time. I mean, Mauler mentioned one of them, you know, all the people talking about, oh, Joker might go and create the impetus for, for shootings and all the rest of that. So there were some absolutely mad yeah. takes. They did all go in one particular direction. Uh, I don't think like, you could be accused of injecting politics into it yourself to point out that a lot of people were primarily concerned about Joker for its political themes. Um, and most of them didn't like it or didn't like what they thought it was going well, to be. I don't. I rarely get to bring this up, so I have to take advantage of it. We once did a podcast covering Jenny Nicholson's opinion of this film. <laughs> it's <pretty infamous. laughs> She, at one point in this awful video she made, theorized that Joker's point as a film was you shouldn't take your medicine. <laughs> and we were like, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's about a lot more than that. And this is the thing. we There was a wave of cringeworthy takes about how bad Joker is. I'm totally fine with criticizing it. There's plenty we can talk about in where it sits in the meta and media of film or whatever versus others and how well it's executed until it, in terms of its story, how much you felt watching it, what it means as an adaptation of Batman Joker, all that sort of stuff. But like some of the stuff people were coming out with, you know, this is a disgusting movie that's designed to make everyone angry at people and to start killing each other. You're like, what are you, wh why are you doing this to this film? You don't need to. Just because everyone like kind of liked it. I mean, it's, it's fine. Because um, if you roll your minds back, do you remember drinking? Like we were all very pessimistic about this film. Joker 1, I mean. Uh... Fuck, and now you're never going back a little ways. Even further um, back than the trailer for the first film, I think we were all like, why the fuck are they doing this? I, I think, yeah, you know what? I think it might have been that period where we just, we hadn't had a, a more serious superhero or, you know, comic book adaptation type movie for a very long time. And um, maybe there was a feeling of, oh God, does this fucking character really need an origin story? Do yeah. we care? Yeah. yeah. Like, where's this going? And Especially so we didn't really Joker appreciate from Suicide Squad. I think that made a lot of people <laughs> yeah. very angry. <laughs> yeah, sorry to cut you up. No, no, that's fine. Uh, I was just winding up anyway. So yeah, I, I get where you're coming from on that one, Mala. I, I, I'm well. just agreeing, but like, oh, just, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I wasn't sure if that was feeding into a larger point that you were about to uh, make there. What I was trying to push is just that we were against it, and then we were like, shit, man. And the, the film, I remember Gary talking to him about it, like it, it kind of earned its you know, place. We were like, all right, fine. You're good. <laughs> like, you, yeah, we, I like I like the cinematography. I like the performances. I like the pacing. I like the way that they do the twists about his, the way his mind works. I like the point it makes. I like all of the, the sets, the costumes. I love the atmosphere. Yes, yes, fine. I like it. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. But um, as time went on, 
like it, it just happens. I think the big counterculture movement started up, and this movie's not even out yet, but people are getting ready to have fights over it because, mm. uh, um, you know, it's, uh, there's there's discussions of whether Todd Phillips should be appreciated as a a real filmmaker or not. Because like that guy made the Hangover. It's like, well, Hangover's pretty funny. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's not that bad. Yeah. Todd well, I mean, he was... said himself, like he transitioned into dramatic movies like Joker because it's essentially illegal to make comedies now. You can't make a comedy that's funny because it's going to mm-hmm. offend someone, and so the environment just doesn't permit it. So that's why he moved over to films like this, and that's a testament to his ability and his versatility as a filmmaker that he can go from something like ridiculous, like The Hangover, to something like The Joker, and make it work and not make it feel like he's out of his depth. That's... There is a th- there is a through line that goes through those movies though todd phillips is act todd phillips really has his finger in the pulse of male culture like he, he seems to have a great ability to understand how men interact with each other on a cultural level and what their cultural concerns are at any given time so if you look for example at road trip it's about a bunch of young guys just being you know young college kids having a good time and, and pursuing their interests at that time in their life and with Joker, the, the first Joker, it's about a man who's lost in a society that's rejected to, rejected him, and his his male concerns just aren't being met at all, and he's very sexually frustrated. And in this one, the what I was really getting from it in terms of theme was uh, sexual frustration is a big one, because the, the character in the first movie becomes obsessed with this woman who he meets in a hallway, and in this one, I was even getting the... I was beginning to consider the possibility that a lot of the musical scenes and a lot of the interactions between him and Harley Quinn will be entirely happening within his own head because he's fantasizing this as a result of his sexual frustration. And I think what Todd Phillips has identified here is a problem with a lot of modern men. To be blunt about it, they can't get laid and they can't attract women because they've been raised in a culture which basically villainizes masculinity and and women don't like men that are weak and not masculine. And if you if you take that message and you take it seriously and you're not a masculine man and you go out into the world, you're going to have a really hard time attracting women. So I, th- I think that Todd Phelps is identified and, that, and that's what he's exploring in this movie on a thematic level. No, I think that's a fair a, a fair cop, actually, with this. And again, I think that probably feeds think? into the why the first movie got such a hostile reception. It's almost like, oh, you're talking about things that we don't want to address. We shouldn't bring this to light. You know, it's... It's it's an interesting reaction, I suppose, from the the general sort of media um, film critic circle. Um, yeah, I think again, bringing it back to that Suicide Squad with Harley Quinn being so obsessed with Joker, that felt comfortable for people to see that she had been manipulated. She had been, you know, she kind of fell in love and 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 she was the victim in that relationship. But if you try to pull it pull it on the other side and show Joker's fragilities, just see his sort of where he's kind of stuck in life, then it that's that doesn't feel comfortable according to to kind of the modern take. Well, like it's, it's interesting as well because um sorry, I, I I'll just make this quick point and then get out of your way. But um yeah there, there's been such an effort to give Harley Quinn like real self-actualization, um, to give her her own movies, to give her her own like video games where she's in charge and she's not defined by the Joker, um, and to break her away from him, like almost like, um, you know, we can't have that. We can't have that like awkward um, psychological codependency that the Joker and Harley Quinn have for each other. She needs to be free of him, and it, it eliminates the very essence of what those two characters are. And for one. I think Mollard said this as well. We're kind of fucking sick of just like trying to make Harley Quinn work (laughs) as a character by herself. She's not that interesting when she's on her own, particularly Margot Robbie's interpretation. I'm sorry, Margot. um, You're a good actress, but like what they've given you as Harley Quinn to play is fucking garbage. Yeah, I wouldn't even blame her. I feel like she was always, she's very much capable of playing a Harley Quinn that all of us would enjoy. Um, like the Suicide Squad kill the Justice League Harley Quinn was just like and, and James Gunn even gave an attempt at it and was awful in the Suicide Squad as far as I'm concerned that Harley Quinn uh, we got the, the Harley Quinn is just not in a good place I wanted to go away but this will be the last shot maybe of me liking her it would be really curious if this is the film that manages to get it and something that struck me about the trailer was uh, an interpretation a lot of people come away with is going to be the maybe he's found possibly some level of equilibrium in prison and she's going to bring Joker back out of him 
She's going to talk about how he made significant change. He made significant impact. You know, the, the trailer has her saying that she's never done anything significant in her life. But what if she gasses him up and then maybe regrets what she releases sort of thing? Like, I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea. But I do get tempted by the idea that these two are the worst thing for each other. Um, and then, you know, the, yeah. the chaos that ensues as a result. Um, cinematography, right? Like, it, it's been talked about by everybody. I am. Um, I'm not going to say it's mind blowing or game changing or change. It's just it's reassuring to me. When I saw the trailer, I was just like, ah, someone who cares about what I see. Cool. <laughs> like no, the spotlight looks... on him, I was just like, oh, what a sweet shot. <laughs> like, it's cool. just nice, solid, reliable. Like, I guess cinematography. It's like how movies used to look 20, 30 years ago, when it was like it wasn't about spectacle. It was just about like characters and and directors showing you what uh, what needed to be seen to highlight the scene. That was nice. Um, I guess my my worry would have been if this if this was in the hands of a different director, say Todd Phillips wasn't involved, he'd signed off directing directing duties to someone else. Um, my worry would have been Harley Quinn is actually the the fucking driving force behind all of this. She's like the mastermind, and Joker is just kind of her puppet. Because wouldn't it be clever if they inverted the dynamic? Because that seems like exactly the kind of thing they would do with modern filmmaking. I don't think it's mm -hmm. going to happen in this one, thank God. But yeah, it just seems like such a danger that's it's always just lurking at the periphery of any film that gets made now. And it's a shame that we're at that point, but that's just what's happened from past experience. Yeah, there's no there's no guarantee that this film's gonna be great or good even. I'm just uh I'm I'm more reassured now than before the trailer came out. Yeah. yeah. It did almost compel me to go and see it. I mean again overriding the the very very potent dislike for musicals that i have is a hard job but i know i was quite impressed with the overall way that the trailer looked it might be that i have spent so many hours looking at godzilla x kong recently so just <laughs> anything that just suggests competency is a step up i don't know but it does look impressive i will give it that do you like any musicals um um like rocky horror picture show maybe I don't think I've ever seen that one i remember thinking cabaret wasn't terrible but then there's not too much music in that which might be why I'm sure that there's probably one somewhere out there. I just couldn't tell you what it was. Did you watch um, blah, The Greatest Showman? No, I think my hatred had set in by that point. <laughs> Sweeney you Todd? Might, you that? might enjoy that. Really? Sweeney, Todd, <laughs> Sweeney Todd really annoyed me. I remember thinking, when it first came on TV, and I'd never seen it before, and I didn't know what it was, you get the first shot, and it looks really good, and he's coming across on the boat, and I think, oh, this looks like it could be an interesting film, and then he starts fucking singing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is Sweetie, Sweetie Todd's about an unfamous musical. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, it's what it is. That's interesting, though. I didn't know that about you. Uh, I'd be curious to see if we could break that streak with any particular <laughs> film. <you know? laughs> I, I'm more of a fan of the old school musicals. Singing in the Rain, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers is probably one of my favorite musicals. It's just so well done. It's like the choreography and everything is so beautiful. And then, of course, if it's an Indian film, musical is more than acceptable and yeah. <laughs> necessary. Music biopics are a kind of musical. They're a disguised musical. They're a musical that pretends to be something else. But for example, yeah. that piece of shite Bohemian Rhapsody garbage queen movie, which I refuse <laughs> to call by the name that they stole from the song. Um, or, or the Elton John movie, Rocket Man, was basically a musical. Uh, did anybody see that? Bloody Bob Marty movie, fuck me! No, bad. wait. What, how was the uh, was the Elton John one any good? I didn't see that. It, it was probably the best of a bad batch, to be honest. It was it was decent, yeah. But I again, heard that the Bob Marley one was a bit shit. It was trash, man. I was miserable in the cinema. I was actually <laughs> kind of sad that I couldn't walk out because I had to go to work after the movie, and I would. Ugh, man, I hate it. It was so boring. It's just so <laughs> fucking boring, and it does all of the tropes that you would expect from these stupid music biopics that you've seen a million times it stank and it was so sterile like bob marley had look the guy had i think 11 kids by 13 different women okay he was not what you would call a moral man do they have shared custody of the women's like, <laughs> three, three women gave birth to one child delightfully <laughs> His ex-wife said, like, he was a good provider, but he spent all his time getting stoned and playing football and, and, and with his music, and he basically paid no attention to his kids. Um, you know, you, you imagine, like, the 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 um, 
the attacks that John Lennon gets for a, for a, abandoning Julian Lennon, which is justified. Like if you look at there's a, there's interviews you can look at of Julian Lennon where he, he says that he was devastated by being abandoned by his father. It took him like decades to forgive John Lennon for what he did, and it really traumatized him. Horrible, and Bob Marley did that times eleven, right? But the movie doesn't make any mention of it. It's completely sterilized. I, I just um. I hated that movie so much. That what Bob Marley movie. Well, did anyone see the Elvis one? Yeah, the Elvis one. I mean, Austin Butler is very good, and I tell you what, it's worth watching just to watch Tom Hanks' performance. Tom Tom Hanks' performance as the Colonel is one of the worst movie performances of the past ten years. But at the same time, Austin Butler is excellent as Elvis, and it's just this weird contrast. Um, what the, the fuck movie... happened to Tom Hanks, by the way? I yeah. feel like he went from being like the, the nicest guy in Hollywood that everyone respected and, and looked up to, to like this fucking joke that everyone just kind of mocks now. I, I don't get it. When did that switch happen? Yeah, I mean, he was in Pinocchio as well. He showed up to that for a paycheck and he was he was awful in it. Yeah, I, I feel like, I don't know. It's like things like Gary when he's making a, a video about the Oscars or whatever. Like he'll often have that Tom Hanks reaction moment when it was like, you know, reacting to Ricky Gervais, like roasting everyone. I he's don't know. He just became like this. Thumbnails. Yeah. Yeah. He just became this yeah. like figure of mockery somehow. I don't know where it came from, but. Yeah, you know, I don't get is. it either. But I think I, I think he's just been in so much. And I think that that it reached some level of saturation point where people are like, was he really ever that talented to deserve to be in pretty much everything? I, I just released a video today and there was a brief shot of Tom Hanks playing Walt Disney uh, in, in the video. And there are so many comments just attacking Tom Hanks when it, I, there's no mention of him at all in the video. It's just there's this visceral reaction people have to him now. It's really interesting. Have you yeah. seen his 90s movies, Baggage Kim, when he was, when he was doing snag roles? You know, snag, sensitive new age guy. That was yeah. a thing in the nineties. Like Hugh Grant, taught, it was this yeah. new generation of uh, like more sensitive rom com type guys, soft men, mm -hmm. uh, coming after the action when when the Arnold Schwarzeneggers and the and the the Sylvester Stallones were, their popularity was starting to die down. The snags came in. Have right, you seen right. those rom com movies? Do you like those type of old Tom Hanks movies where he was a love interest and he was a heartthrob? You, you don't know, like he's got mail. <laughs> Yeah, you've got male, mm. big. Yeah, stuff like that. Women yeah, love that like stuff. That. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've never liked him as a leading man. I just don't find him handsome enough for that. He's just, he's not that classic, attractive type. I like yeah. Hugh, I like Hugh Grant. I, I, I'm, um, I grew up reading a lot of Jane Austen. So whenever I look at some of those like gentleman type, I'm, I really enjoyed that kind of masculinity, even though I know. Um, you know, so funny. Not, about popular. sorry uh no it's okay uh, it, it, what's funny to me about hugh grant is um i way prefer like as i was familiar with that era thanks to my family of several women uh love watching hugh grant that era <laughs> I was just like whatever what i love about him was watching the gentleman and dungeons and dragons i yes. way prefer slimy hugh grant <laughs> where he's oh yeah yeah he's great in the gentleman he's great yeah he got to like he got to middle age and you know he's he's kind of lost his boyish good looks now yeah. and like yeah I've discovered he could just play the like the villainous like yeah. Brit that used to be such a trope in Hollywood. I think yeah, like, maybe it's been I think it works for me a lot because I believed he was full of shit and those characters are absolutely full of shit. Like that's the <laughs> point of them. And I'm like, yeah, I buy this. This is good. This works for me. In the uh, gentleman, I, I every like, scene that Hugh Grant is in, he just he crushes it in that. He crushed it. Mm -hmm. what, what was the what was his fucking name? The uh, the gentleman. Hold on, gentleman cast the guy who plays the main antagonist in the movie. Um, oh yeah, the Asian uh, uh, no no no. He's the he's the he's the guy who's growing all this stuff. He's trying to sell his drugs business. Oh, um, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, what did you make of Matthew McConaughey in that? Because I thought he was miscast. Oh, I loved him in that. You liked so. Him? so well dressed like the the energy the charisma i like could not stop thinking about every single one of his looks and like his lines it was perfect i loved it yeah i i did like this comment that came in as well um from jeff it says the pop star to actor worked out pretty well for mark Wahlberg. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, it, 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 it did, did from a financial yeah. point of view because, yeah, like, I, I think a few years running, he was like one of the highest paid actors in Hollywood, bar none. Um, yeah. But yeah, in terms of his actual acting ability, fucking Christ! Like, Have you guys ever Mark seen his, his like routine, the routine that he has for his day? Have you guys ever seen this? Oh yeah, it's no. get up at like three a.m., pray yeah. for five hours, and then like work out for another six hours, and then go to bed again or something. Like it's <laughs> oh. bizarre. The best, the best part though is that he slots in like five minutes of time with family slash answer emails. So his family. <laughs> <Five minutes. laughs> you can just imagine he bangs off like twenty emails, and they're all like yes or I agree or no, don't do that. Like, yeah. That's all you get from him. Uh, but he says, what's really cringe is when rappers try to act. Although Method Man has done that well, the other 99.9% are fucking terrible. Uh, I mean, yeah, I would agree with that as well. Um, yeah. Who 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 else enjoyed Vin um, fucking... I was going to say Ice T. It's not. It's the other Ice guy. Ice Cube? Cube? Yeah, Ice Cube. Oh, yeah. yeah. Super. He always <laughs> plays that same two-dimensional character in every movie he's yeah. done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you guys watch the Gentleman Show, by the way? Yeah. No, it's yes. good. It's very good. I really enjoyed that. Finally, it's... there was like an attractive male character, like very, very. I, I thought it was a great male character. That was that was something that struck me actually. It's like the male lead isn't a bumbling idiot, and he isn't um, neurotic. He isn't like he's not Your one of those guys was. where you just, where you're just like, oh god, shut the fuck up. Like yeah. he's. He, Kind of not a manly man, but like at least a guy who's got a little bit of wherewithal about him. I think and that's it's a, nice. It's a really good formula to have a competent person and then a family member who's a fucking idiot that's ruining things. Yeah. It's a yeah. It's fun to watch someone who is good at their job have to solve really difficult problems that aren't necessarily their fault. It's a, it's a good formula. I, I think when we would have talked about this at some other point, but that. Uh, it reminds me of like Guy Ritchie at his best. It'll often be that like there'll be one member of the group that makes one stupid mistake because they're the like the person's brother or something. And yeah. you're like, oh shit, what have you done? Because like I was watching it with a friend, and the second the safe money was gone, like it was, it was like the oh, brothers yeah. got it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <it's the> <laughs> frittered it away or something stupid. I was so pissed off. I was like off with his head immediately. And then that whole chicken scene was incredible. Yeah. <laughs> the chicken <laughs> scene was fantastic. Yeah. It, it's even yeah. the bit where he has to steal the sports car and the brother insists on like waiting outside and you're like, I know he's going to fuck this up somehow. And, like sure enough, his car can't start so he, <laughs> he gets captured. Yeah. <laughs> fucking crazy. Dude, that lady was fucking crazy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And Susie Glass was a great character too. I really liked the dynamic between her and. Oh, thank goodness, oh, eh? We've got another one we can reference now. Excellent modern female character that's actually very <laughs> yes. well written. Well written. Who, who's not just yeah. like a total bitch and doesn't just exist to make all the male characters look like shit in comparison. It's like, no, there's well, a good, interesting back and forth dynamic between them. I was yeah. enjoying it throughout, but the parts where I liked her the most is when she started showing vulnerabilities like where things weren't going exactly the way she wanted or family members were being threatened and you could like that whole scene where her brother's being threatened to lack yeah. any spoilers uh i was very much enjoying her performance yep oh it's nice oh, to see fine. it yeah um, yeah guy Ritchie, well done like please give us more shows like that that'd be nice oh dude gentlemen season two i'll watch it day one give me <laughs> yeah it's, uh, it's easy but I you know his John movies are not doing as well as we would expect like someone just referenced in the chat operation fortune which is a great movie but I, I feel like it barely made any blip well same with the covenant um mm. i don't know if it's just like there's an element of people still associating with he just has to do gangster movies and if he does anything beyond that like you, you just don't make the connection and you think oh this isn't gonna suit him i don't want to watch this and it's a shame because again the covenant was a really nicely made movie good performances good storyline good stuff um, just feel like it didn't get that much attention at the time. Yeah, the Mammoth Uncle is another one that was a pretty decent, not amazing, but it's a it's a it's a good sort of it's spy fun. James Bond knockoff type of thing. Which yeah, it's decent. It was the closest uh, the we're ever going to get to Henry Cavill as Bond. So yeah, enjoy oh, that. Yeah, the Man from Uncle. Mm. Yeah. Show. Um, I did like this one as well. Uh, I thought Mark Wahlberg was great <laughs> as Mark Wahlberg in The Departed. <laughs> Unironically just, true, yes, he was great in that movie. Angry Mark Wahlberg, <laughs> just he was yelling in it. at fucking yeah. everyone. Yeah, he was in it for like four minutes, but those four minutes were very entertaining. Yeah. Uh, now, 
we've we've all been having a good time tonight. But you know who isn't having a good time? The fine people of Hollywood. No, I know, and I'm gutted just as much as you are. But it seems like they've hit hard times. Um, I call it, according to this article from Deadline. Um, th there's a whole slew of these that have come out in the past week or so, but they say Hollywood contraction hits entertainment executive jobs. This is a full scale depression. Uh, it says um, LinkedIn is usually used by professionals for networking with people for their field, posting updates when they get a job, etc., etc. These days, as one former industry type put it, it's become a kind of therapy site for unemployed entertainment executives who share their frustrations over the lack of opportunities in Hollywood and amid a major contraction. Um, I've seen a lots of downturns, lots of job losses, but I've never seen anything like this, one veteran TV executive said. This is a full-scale depression for the entire entertainment industry. Um, over the past year, there have been waves of layoffs at Disney, Warner Brothers, Discovery, Paramount, NBC Universal, Amazon, Lionsgate, Netflix, Sony, and basically everyone else. Um yeah the um the sorry the layoffs that have affected not just executives but it's affecting the writers as well um it says here this is one um i'm scared why it's a brutal time to be a tv writer the end of peak tv has ushered in an era of contraction with fewer buyers and fierce competition for the few shows that are staffing Quote, people are in complete survival mode. Um, that, that mic is, we. I'm not sure if it's the same article we covered on, on FNT on Friday, but th that one goes on basically to say that the end of peak TV translates as the CW doesn't exist anymore and it's not buying our shit. So everything's really bad. So effectively, the CW gets the credit for, for buying awful TV shows and putting lots of money into them and hiring lots of people. And now it well, no longer exists. There's lots of writers going unemployed because there's not enough people to buy their crap works. I don't think it's just the CW because it, it encompasses all the streaming services, uh, as they put here. It says the streamers like Netflix and um, uh, HBO max size their slates. The broadcast pipelines for um, all of them, Peacock, Hulu, Paramount Plus, uh, Amazon, are drying up. A decade ago, broadcasters collectively ordered 98 pilots per year. Today, that number can be counted on just one hand. Wow. So, I mean, that's the scale of the contraction that you're seeing here. Um, it's It sounds pretty horrific. Um, there was another one, actually, from Breitbart here. It says, um, unemployed Hollywood writers are resorting to bartending DoorDash gigs as studios slash their spending. Um, but like, yeah, not I, a lot of people do that, right? It's certainly like on the lower end of things. Um, you know, I was in London for uni and you know, I knew people who wanted to be, say, showrunners at theatres or they wanted to be writers on this, that or the other. Um, and you know, I worked in this escape room and had loads of people. Like, everyone in that escape room was working there because they needed to make some money because the temporary jobs they had in the fields they wanted to be in had ended at some point. So everyone, uh, certainly at the lower end, has that experience. Uh, writers are not owed a job by the industry, certainly if they're not turning out things that anybody actually wants to watch. Um, that doesn't help. But... I find it slightly difficult to take that kind of thing very seriously when bartending is something that particularly early career professionals in notably transient jobs have to do all the time anyway. Like I've done it. Most of the people I know in that field have done it. Um, you I go into so. that job and career because you know it's a risk, right? And like risks sometimes do not pay off. Well, I think the difference here is that uh, you've got people who are at the level of showrunners who are experiencing mm. the same problems, which... It it shouldn't be like that, I suppose. Like you would imagine, when you get to the level of showrunner on, you know, even a mildly successful show, you've essentially secured a, a pretty stable employment, um, or particularly from an income point of view. And it seems like it isn't the case anymore. Uh, I mean, it says here. Hold on, let's see. Um, yes, <laughs> this is a quote here. Um, as a showrunner who is a queer woman of color can and I, I can't get work, that's saying a lot. It's very frustrating, one industry veteran told The Hollywood Reporter. I never thought I'd be a writer for as long as I have, but I didn't expect to run into a brick wall. I thought it would be slow tapering, but this feels like a complete cataclysm. Uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to forgive Hollywood for this. Um, 
Another writer said, that's where a lot of us are. Almost everyone I know who had a deal, that deal doesn't exist anymore. Uh, yeah, the demise of peak TV has meant fewer opportunities for even seasoned Hollywood writers. Studios are taking an axe to their budgets as the industry is facing near catastrophic economic headwinds. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, locking down to avert a global pandemic followed by a very, very expensive round of strikes in which everybody demands to be paid more might have some economic consequences for the people in the industry. Um, you could have sort of seen this coming if you were uh, not, you know, the kind of person who says that Hollywood owes me a job, which these a lot of these people seem to think they do. It's not easy for anybody in this position, obviously, but they're not the only ones in this position. Um, lots of people across the entire world in every sector of the economy are, are in similar positions. Uh, and it's largely due to factors outside their control. And in some cases, it's factors that are within their control. Like, again, not turning in scripts that people actually want to watch for shows that people actually want to watch. But if you're going to make it much more cheaper and more profitable, for instance, for a streaming service to look to Japan or Korea for their drama content, not least because it's better received than most of the scripts they receive from Western content creators at the moment, then you're going to put yourself out of a job. Um, and you will have to end up working a bar. And then maybe once the economy recovers, you'll find your work experience gets you back into the industry again. But until then, it's it's not just you in that boat. And there's nothing particularly special about you, film writers, that demands you be kept in employment. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I And I guess it feels like they were allowed to exist within this golden age. Um, they were almost exist existing within a protected bubble where they could produce any kind of garbage that uh, they felt like. And it seemed like there was no financial penalties. There was no career re repercussions for it. We were subjected to just an absolute deluge of shit TV shows. I mean, like you only have to take a look at Disney Plus or, mm -hmm. um, you know, things like pretty much 90% of the content on Netflix to recognize that problem. And this is the bubble bursting now. And it's kind of necessary to see this kind of economic reality set in where oh you have been producing crap for the past five years or so nobody's watching your crap but it costs tens of millions if not hundreds of millions of dollars to, to make uh we need to reconfigure and find a way to make money again and we are not going to move forward with you because you don't produce anything good yeah i'm fine with that happening because it needed to happen yeah, this is the realistic correction that we've been wondering, when is it coming, right? At what point will there be intelligent decisions in who's getting what job versus it being tossed to, you know, whatever checkbox-based box decision that was happening for a long time? And then there was the, you know, golden time of TV shows for the last 10 years. There were so many TV shows being greenlit. Netflix was just going full, you know, full pedal, metal to the pedal. And now I think all of that budget is drying up and advertising is drying up. And, and then a lot of the focus of, of audiences has, has also shifted because we've gotten so much rubbish for such a long time that audiences are really bored. They're tired. There's so many people who are turning to older catalogs versus the newer stuff. And then honestly, TikTok has really eaten into the concept of, of, of entertainment. Why sit and commit to a TV show that's going to be, you know, 20 hours versus for the next two hours, I'll just scroll through, a, you know, a thousand videos. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, there was an interesting statistic for this recently where wasn't it like more than 50% of the content that's being watched on say Netflix or, or Amazon is um, older TV shows. It's stuff that's more than 10 years old. Because people are just reverting to like the older classics, I suppose, um, partly out of nostalgia and partly because this stuff was probably just better written and is actually more entertaining than the garbage that they're being fed nowadays. I just think that's an interesting that's statistic, really, and it's probably only going to get worse as time passes. I think there's an element of the snake having eaten its own tail at this point because for years we've said Hollywood has eaten its own tail because it keeps remaking these IPs and it keeps you know just puking out the same crap again and again and eating it and puking it out again and you've got all these remakes and requels and sequels and prequels and at this point it's like every IP is dead the snake has eaten its own tail there's no more tail left to eat they've run mm. out of ideas you look at the the release calendar for this year it's just a bunch of remakes 
and requels and, and prequels and just garbage that people aren't interested in. And it, it's almost gotten to the point where the the stuff that is the most successful, like you look last year, you've Oppenheimer, Mario, and Barbie, and those are three franchises that people haven't really seen. Oppenheimer's not a franchise, but those are three new original ideas that people haven't really seen on a, new, on a big screen before, and they showed up in huge numbers. I think there's a huge thirst for fresh, original, creative ideas among audiences. People are just sick of seeing the same shit for the 400th time every time yeah. they go to the cinema or turn on a TV screen. It's like, I don't want the 84th fucking Marvel TV show. Just give me something new and original. I don't want to go see another Star Wars movie or another you know, superhero in, in Spandex Saves the World movie. Do something fresh and original. You've got to give newer generations their own their own sense of identity and in, and in, in movies and in culture. And I don't mean I, I hate the, this expression they have that oh the audiences need to see themselves reflected on screen. Hollywood thinks that means they need to see their skin color on screen or are their genitals or whatever it is or their sexuality. <laughs> No, give, give them a sense of cultural identity. Like, what does it mean to be a 25-year-old man or a 25-year-old woman in 2024, right? Mm. Put that on screen and people will show up. Yeah, it's funny. Absolutely. Like, I actually had someone, I had someone emailing me about this sort of thing recently where they're like, I'm 17 years old and I'm grown up in, like, the world that we have now. And I feel like I'm fucking lost because there's nothing for me to, like attached to there's nothing that i can say like oh this is unique to my culture my generation this is our thing we don't have that like all i can do is refer back to old stuff and it makes me feel really depressed because it's like my generation's got nothing to call our own mm -hmm. and i thought you're right <laughs> you're exactly right you don't have anything yeah and that, that sucks but like i don't i don't know what to tell people like that like there isn't really anything no. I don't know. You, you've got like Twitch streamers, haven't you? And TikTok. You Hassan Piker. He's he's one of your own, kind of. What about yeah. John Wick drinker? That's theirs. There you go. The, yeah, <laughs> that really defined a generation. Nice one. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the, 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 there are many like changing trends. Some of it is just like this general economic downturn thing. Some of it is just a a fundamental shift in the way that that things are made and, and put to series. So like if you can compare the total number of uh, new shows piloted with a decade ago, and obviously things look really bleak, but you can compare the total number of new shows piloted versus the total number that are ordered straight into full series production, and that number's increased massively. So like, what, what you're seeing is fewer small-scale risks being taken on a smaller number of projects, and many more projects just being said, right, yeah, we are going to immediately invest full-scale in whatever you are producing for the full run of that series. So we're putting more money into fewer projects and we're banking on those things. And that's probably in part a reflection on the way that streaming services work and the fact that they are all very much dependent on these IPs they've been expensively buying up. So there are fewer chances for people to start creating things, but it's not that, that there are no new things being made. It's just that we are taking longer term risks and what well, studios rather are taking longer term risks on them than they used to do. Because it's not the same old you know, network TV era when you had... A, a commissioned pilot for a new sitcom every five minutes. Now it's, no, we are going to have a, a Marvel show. It's going to star this character and we are definitely going to have eight episodes. So please just go straight ahead and make that for us, please. Thank you very much. Uh, fewer writers will get hired, but that's the way streaming services choose to operate. Eventually that will either work or not. And if it doesn't work, then they'll shift to a different model as they already seem to be doing. Well, contractually, don't they have to hire more writers now anyway? Because part of the terms of their strike resolution was like they have to have 57 different writers for every yeah. show. You have to pay them more and to... you have to hire a higher number of them at minimum, which is just asking for people on the lower end of the scale to be priced out, basically. So that, again, fewer opportunities for people breaking in. And even there will be a net reduction in, in opportunities for people who are already in the industry, but they will get the pick of the jobs because who would you choose to hire if you have to pay them more? And you have to have a certain number of people with established track records or people who amount to a risk. No one's going to be hiring young writers. What's the uh, what's the resolution then? Like in an ideal world, like how do you get out of this hole that they're in right now? I'd honestly want to see to what extent it really is a hole because like, we're comparing, say, the last decade's worth. But the last decade has been defined almost consistently by this incredibly loose money. Like there's been immense amounts of money printed, and we've had immense amounts of a monetary freeway, which essentially just allow you to throw as an investor any amount you like at any studio you want to make anything you want. We've had loose money all this time. And the actual point of comparison will be, well, when did we last have a period of economic tightening and how many pilots were made back then? Like, were, were things more comparable in, say, 
the early 90s and they, as they are now than they are, say, between 2010 and 2020. So I'd want to see like that there actually is a hole and whether it's not just a correction for basically a decade of irresponsibility, because that's a big prospect. And I sort of suspect that that's a large part of it. It might just be that this is more like the natural rate of production that the industry can actually support, as opposed to it being this aberration. Oh, no, we've fallen from what should be our height. It's not your height. It's just a trick. I mean, at the moment, it feels like there's there's definitely a hole in terms of the quality of their creative output, and yeah. I guess I'm wondering how do you know how do they pull themselves out of that? Like, it's not to say that there's nothing good getting made now, but like on a whole, uh, it feels like if you were to jump back 10, 15 years, like when you were in that era of, you know, like The Sopranos, The Wire, like Breaking Bad, we're we're not really getting things like that at the mm. moment. I think it, it comes down to the people who are in charge and what what's their sort of North Star whenever they're making any sort of decision. Uh, and it, a good exa example, I know this is not necessarily apples to apples, but a good example is Boeing. And Boeing is having all of these PR nightmares around the quality of their products. And if you guys have ever watched the documentary that was on Netflix about why the the there's been such a massive deterioration in quality at Boeing has been because the people who used to run that company cared about safety first. It was the top, that was the top priority of every single person in charge. And that was the unifying call to action for every single employee. And so employees that were focused on safety knew that they were protected by their higher ups because that was what was being encouraged. But then it shifted to, it became about the bottom line. It became about money. So at that point, if one particular engineer points out that there's a massive flaw with the design, he's now at risk of losing his job because of the amount of money it's going to cost to fix that and how much it's going to set back the product from going live and then, you know, earning millions and it's going to impact, you know, the stock price and all these other things, all because now the higher ups only care about the money. And then the impact of that has been that the product is has severely deteriorated that this you know whistleblower has to come out and explain about how exactly um, employees are being treated when they're trying to call important things to the management's you know attention and i think it's the same thing all over the place including hollywood where initially where for a long time the main focus was quality we're going to tell good stories we're going to tell stories that people care about we're going to talk and you know some might be a hit, some might end up being a hit some might not you can't you don't really know what's going to take off necessarily what's going to have that magic factor and just be this runaway hit if you even look at a story like, like a movie like mean girls like who would have thought mean girls was going to be have such a big impact culturally where it's like so highly quoted and it's you know what you were saying drinker about a 17 year old reaching out to you and saying there's nothing that represents me and when i was in high school mean girls came out and that was like the movie that represented our generation uh, at least from like a girl's side so it it's i think that's what's really gone away now is that on an individual level the focus isn't on this like higher vision of telling good stories and like making good movies or like high quality stuff everything is just money what's going to get us immediate brand recognition why make anything unique when we can make another bad boys <clears throat> movie which is there's going to be a new bad boys movie so it's just that that's that's the whole focus now but it's all about protecting oh. the position, isn't it? It's it's antithetical to taking a risk once you've poured so much money into a thing. You actually become risk averse about it. So, like your Boeing example is a good example of that. But you you can say the same thing with with movie TV production and and the over reliance on established IPs. You've got a, a bunch of studios who've been at the top of the game for a very long time, and they are very concerned with not losing ground against their rivals because there are newer and more nimble companies which are trying to take their bacon. Um, and so, what you get is them pouring immense amounts of money into things that they think are guaranteed to make them at least some of that back in order to keep their position secure. But that basically guarantees that you're not spending that same amount of money on five or six riskier shows, which might not take off. Uh, you're spending all of it on... Is, uh, they always come back to The Mandalorian for some reason, but that might be because <laughs> it, it has a budget of a feature film. So you, you're spending, what, $200 million on a season of The Mandalorian? That's insane. How many actual risks could you take on smaller TV shows I don't know, where's the next Firefly coming from? Could you maybe spend $15 million trying to create a new science fiction television? 
franchise, that might be fun. <clears> but they won't do that because they are absolutely scared shitless of losing their industry position. And that will probably I, be the thing that guarantees they do lose it. I mean, even you talk about TV shows, you can make a, a reasonably good movie for 15 million. Hmm? You know, it's not, not going to yeah, be yeah. some like special effects extravaganza, but you can do something quite interesting with, with, with the interesting characters. Take a risk oh. on something new. Like, instead of making 10 episodes of fucking The Mandalorian, yeah, like, release 10 movies and see where they go. Like, mm. some of them are about to do well. You know, when you were talking about uh, what they have for this era, I saw someone in chat mention Fortnite, and I was like, shit, <laughs> that's probably a better answer than we realize, because it is, like, this <laughs> big melting pot of previous IPs mm. that were popular. You know, and it it's almost like we're in an era of they have a big soup and they just keep changing it's like adding different spices being different ips to be like keep eating the soup keep eating the soup it's like can we have anything else like no soup it's the it's just just eat the soup <laughs> like and it's like why don't they like the soup as much it's like i don't know throw fucking thanos in there and if it's got like, this season it's it's potato soup. Yeah. and next season it's <laughs> carrot soup and the season after that well, it's yeah, leek. Um, What's funny about it is it, it like degrades all of those IPs at once. They all become gray and hollow and they mix and melt into this big soup of IPs to the point where it's just like, wow, you, you need to make something else. Something I think big, you're calling it soup, cool. but it's really sludge, isn't it? Like that's mm. it's the better term for it's it. Called it's called an sludge. analogy drinker. <laughs> Gosh. I mean, no, it's like uh, with my soup, okay. <laughs> when, when, Bob Iger, when Bob Iger was the first person to discover that people play video games and he's like he decided that <laughs> Actually, yeah. yeah, we're gonna do like Disney version of Fortnite. It's the same thing again. It's just like, yeah, but whereas you're populating this with stuff that you've expensively bought that other people have made, and now you're just gonna put it in a new form and you're just gonna shove it in front of a bunch of kids in Fortnite for a season. And that's the extent of your cultural vision for these properties. It's just how can we monetize it as quickly in a Fortnite fashion? And the, squeeze the, as much yeah, yeah. out of new, it. Ever. Yeah, exactly. You're never gonna add anything new to Fortnite unless you build new things to add into it. Mm -hmm to stick to the, the soup idea is like someone sees a steak that looks real good and they're like yeah 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 we'll give you that and you're like sweet they chop it up to tiny pieces and toss it in the soup and mix and you're like <laughs> <laughs> okay well like, that's how you will enjoy this in the future you, you play it through fucking Fortnite. You're like all right yeah but i mean the disney analogy is perfect because you know you you look at the things that they bought up right you take things like lucasfilm they gave us star wars they gave us the indiana jones franchise they gave us willow <laughs> yay but you know like <laughs> things that that were a mainstay of culture back then uh you know like other things like back to the future again like they they bought over fox so they've kind of got all that stuff as well and it's sad because where is that where is that stuff that creative impetus that gave us things like that that people still talk about even now People still talk about Star Wars, obviously. They still talk about Back to the Future fondly. They still talk about Indiana Jones, although Disney have done their best to like stamp that out. But the point is, where is the next generation of that coming from? It just doesn't seem to exist anymore. The conditions that allow that to happen well, don't exist. Not only do they not seem to have the conditions, but they don't seem interested in creating a new one. Like that, that, That's what we... You know, like Frozen Empire was... Ghostbusters the steak getting chopped up, tossed in the soup, and then you open the tap, and that's it. There you go, your, your gruel of Ghostbusters. That tastes vaguely like Ghostbusters, right? Drink like, up. Yeah. Fuck yeah. yeah. Soup. <laughs> they were trying. <laughs> with Frozen Empire, they were Enjoy trying it. to do everything. They were they are trying to key jangle the older generations. They were trying to bring in the younger generations. They were trying to appeal to as broad an age demographic as possible, and it just ended up a complete and com a total disaster. Oh, my, my, um, it's funny, like my opinion and my attitude towards this revamped Ghostbusters has soured so fucking much in like the past year or so, because I gave Afterlife a free pass to, I, I, to a degree. I was like, oh, you know, it wasn't Ghostbusters 2016, so it was better than that. Yay. <laughs> it was, it was really made with good intentions towards the fans. They did their best to like, you know give us the Ghostbusters movie we always wanted. And then you get a bit of distance and a little bit of time and you look back on it again and realize, oh fuck no, this was like the most cynical cash grab, creatively bankrupt nonsense that almost makes The Force Awakens look fucking good. And then yeah, like Frozen Empire was just a continuation of that. 
And I hate that kid that gets cast in everything now. That very like gangly looking creature. Oh, he's Finn put in everything. Finn Wolfhard, yeah. yeah. He's kind of he's yeah. kind of got that Timothy Chalamet look that Hollywood are trying yeah. to push, but they don't. But like, like an AIDS. uglier version. Like yeah, he's like it, Timothy Chalamet with AIDS. Yeah, yeah he looks like he's. <laughs> it's almost like he's like an orphan to... child somewhere. Yeah, oh not God. Yeah, <laughs> well, he might watch this show for all we know. Well, somebody, <laughs> please, so fucking buy him a cheeseburger or something. <laughs> Help him out. You get the sense that Hollywood are almost trying to socially engineer physical masculinity out of movies. Like they don't yes. want to cast the big jockey guys, you know, those type of young guys, the athletic types. They want to cast the Finn Wolfhards and the Timothy Chalamets. And like they're good actors. I'm not saying they're bad actors at all, but I think they're quite good. But um, I mean, what what happened to the the jocks? You know, the the young, built, more masculine guys. It's like they, they don't want them in there in their movies anymore. Yeah, well, that's dangerous though. Despot. Well, that's going to give guys not, like, that's too, ideas both ways patient. as well. Like a lot of women, you know, very good looking, young, curvy women, they can't get roles in Hollywood anyway anymore because they're too beautiful. You know, you can't have you can't have the you must avert the dreaded male gaze. I mean, look at what's her name? She's got you know the world's best pair of breasts. Um, Sweeney, uh, Sydney Sweeney, like they completely covered her up in Madam Web, right? So you on on the one hand you've got they're bringing in all these wimpy looking guys and they're trying to make the women look as unaffeminate as possible. It's so boring to look at on screen. I well, think wait, isn't what, she famous for getting them out in several things? Yeah, she's, she's, <laughs> well, she's, she's, I, she's I, I think get them out on the red carpet. She she got them out in like you know lower budget movies and stuff, and I don't think people really became aware of her until the premiere of Madam Web, where she just decided, <laughs> "Fuck it, like I'm gonna I'm gonna get what I can out of this movie," and it's like, mm -hmm. "Well, I'll just get them out," and like suddenly everyone's aware of her now, and that put her on the map. And damn, the I almost think like if that movie had been good, people wouldn't have noticed her somehow. Like this, this somehow turned out to be the best possible scenario well, for Sydney Sweeney. She was a part of Euphoria, right? And that's that's uh, 165 million for a season. So it's not exactly, you know, I mean, Blue Platoon no, was I just mean, talking it, about how ridiculous Mandalorian's budget was. No, it was definitely like they obviously spent money on. I'm, I guess I'm just saying, like in terms of general awareness, I don't think yeah. people really became. No, yeah, you're right about that. She this. she blasted like I think it's uh, people being generally aware, like sort of being like I think I've seen it before, and then Madam Web and. I don't know if you saw some of the clips that she said. She made fun of it as well, right? That was like a really good move by her, to be honest. You may as well have just told them all to do that. It would actually make the film probably more financially successful. But yeah, no, you're right. Like that, there was a de definitive change over the past few months of people talking about her, which is kind of funny. Because um, I was going to say as well, how do you explain, like, uh, there are still, you know, like The Rock, nobody likes him showing up in anything anymore, but he's undeniably, you know, a big fucking guy. Like, <laughs> Yeah, but, he, 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 yeah, but he's like he's this, comically big. Um, the to uh, what's the thing with Chris Pratt on Amazon? Um, Terminal uh, list. Terminal list. Like, there are still things out there. Maybe they're not getting the same prominence in sort of like you know, AAA Hollywood releases, but like it, they've not completely disappeared from the media landscape. The the Amazon's yeah. an interesting one because they'll produce things like that. They'll produce things like Reacher, where you have what are essentially just traditional masculine heroes you know like big muscly guys who who fight evil and and you know do all the heroic stuff like fine like straight out of like 1980s action flicks um but then they'll produce things like rings of power at the same time so like there's no rhyme or reason to what they do but they seem to be a bit of a, an aberration in terms of the mm. general hollywood landscape um and i agree with despot like if you were to if you were to sum up, like, what is the in thing in Hollywood at the moment, or at least what do they want to be the in thing? It is like fembot guys like Timothy Chalamet, who is undeniably a beautiful man, but he doesn't <laughs> exactly radiate masculinity, um, and he's not something that like young guys are necessarily going to aspire to. It's he's not the the sort of jock, masculine, rugged archetype that you okay. used to get in previous generations. Against that, I'm trying to think as I don't, I'm not familiar with his entire filmography, but I'm trying to think of a film in which he was cast, which should have gone to somebody who was more like traditionally buff and masculine. I think Dune. I think yeah. Dune itself. Well, Dune no, he, no, he matches Paul Atreides' oh, depiction yeah. in the book almost yeah. word for word. Yeah, that, that is the actual that was... description of Paul Atreides. Okay. Uh, Wonka, for example. I don't think Wonka is meant to be a, 
a, a massive beefcake. I'm trying to think what else that like, he's been in that should have gone to somebody Hollywood else. Hollywood don't want to make those types of movies that would invite strong, masculine-looking men. Yeah, I think that's the thing. Yeah, maybe. Um, so I'm, I haven't read the books for full disclosure, but the reason I was saying with Dune, just as someone who's coming into it fresh, watching the movie, when there's all this hand-to-hand -hand combat, but looking at his very thin stature, it was hard to believe that. Especially it's, it's, him going up against Austin Butler, it just felt a little like I was surprised he was not getting completely dominated. It's more accurate because he's he has Benny Jesuit training. I, I don't know how well that's explained in the movie, to be honest. I think the movie okay. kind of dropped a lot up the ball a little bit because yeah. um it didn't explain really that Paul had uh, it didn't really even go into the, 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 the details of what Benny Gesserit training is on a physical level and how that was applied to the Fremen and then they used that to overcome the Harkonnens. That was a criticism I had yeah. of it. But because he's been trained in this kind of not magical, but almost magical art of like um, micro muscle <clears throat> training, which makes you super fast and things like that. And I think, it, yeah, hand-to-hand -hand combat like functions a bit differently in the, the universe of Dune because okay. it's a world where people have got shields around them and stuff. And so it's less right. about like physical strength and more about control and precision. So I, I can buy into that. It's, it's fine. Like okay. I think he's perfect for the role of Paul. Um, but that's a very, very specific role that he was well suited to. I just yeah. think, you know, if you tried to put him into like a more conventional action movie, it would be like that. That time that they put um what's his fucking name that was in Predators? Um Oh Adrian Brody. Adrian Brody, yeah. Like trying mm. to take this really skinny, wiry guy and put him into an extra role. It's like, oh, it doesn't work. And then the only other movie he was in that was also hard to believe was The King. I love The King and I think his acting in it was fantastic. But cool. there are there is a scene where, you know, he's dressed up in in full um medieval armor and he he has a, a scene of hand to hand combat again in that. And it's just kind of hard to believe that. Do you on this I, note, do you think someone like Keanu Reeves shouldn't be in John Wick? Do you think someone bigger and buffer should be? It, no, it was. It, it, I don't think someone needs to be like excessively buff. It's just that Timothy Chalamet is excessively skinny. I think just even just some a man of like normal stature, like even if you look at Roadhouse, um, Patrick Swayze, you know, is it from the 80s? I think, I mean, he's not this yeah. like super buff like Jake Gyllenhaal, right? But it, it's believable that that feels believable, but it's just Timothy Chalamet is like real thin. And you see that in The King, there are scenes where he's shirtless. There are scenes even, you know, in, he's he shows a lot of his body in a lot of different movies. So you can just see how terribly skinny he is. In Call Me By Your Name, he, you actually get to see his butt, which is something I will never Jesus, get over in my life. <laughs> I saw that yesterday. I'm trying to watch that movie at the minute. It's boring uh, me to tears. It's can, really bad. Can, I'll never can, get over that in, and not in a good way. Can I also make the suggestion that there's sometimes a difference between um, a character or an actor who embodies masculinity and also just his physical size and muscle mass? Like, those two are not always linked necessarily. Like, if you look at a lot of the, uh, I guess, the kind of Hollywood film stars back from the, the 50s and 60s, they weren't big muscle men but they embodied yeah. the masculine ideals of like stoicism, um, composure, like emotional distance, all that sort of thing. You know, like guys like John Wayne, he was never a big muscly guy. He didn't need to be though, but he embodied that, that kind of rugged masculinity that people look for in America at the time. And so they, they don't have to be the same thing. Um, and I just think that is the element that's kind of missing from most actors nowadays. Like, um echo ben chamberlain Quinn. actually did it did it well echo chamberlain did a really good video about this and i think he used rings of power um as his comparison versus something like lord of the rings where um the heroes in and i say heroes quite loosely <laughs> in rings of power um uh, not just the characters but the actors themselves just look very soft and effeminate and ineffectual you don't believe that these guys could do any of this stuff when you look at vigo mortensen he just looks like a guy who, who you could turn him loose in the wilderness and he would come back with a fucking fur coat on and a million dollar smile. Like he would just have a great old time. You take the cast of Rings of Power and they would be dead within five minutes. Like they just look soft and weak and vulnerable and just they, they don't look like they can do any of this stuff. And I think this is my long winded way of saying that that 
breed of actor, that breed of person just doesn't seem to be in Hollywood at the moment. It doesn't seem was, to be a thing they're creating anymore. There was a character like that, uh, that sort of masculine ideal, the psychologically masculine man. There was a character like that in the Stranger Things season four. I forget what he was called, but he was the the head of the, the Dungeons and Dragons club. It was it Eddie? And then yeah. they killed him off. He was very, and he was, he was a very young guy, but he very much embodied that confident masculine ideal. It's not super strong, but confident, knows how to have a good time, social, and uh, not overly emotional or anything. Eddie, but then they killed him off. He was a great character. They shouldn't have killed him off. There were other characters. Oh, yeah, I agree. Um... And should easily have killed off, um, who are just awful. Like the the the, the black kid, he's a, he's a very boring character. He could easily have been killed off. Or yeah. um, there was, there's this couple, this will they, won't they couple. Kill both of them. I, I don't care. Get rid of them. <laughs> will they, won't they? <laughs> they won't. But they, but they, 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 <laughs> they got rid of Eddie, who, who does embody. And look, he's a young guy, so he's still, he's, be, he's becoming a man. You know, he's, he's in that stage of masculine becoming. But that's really fascinating, because how often do we get to see that masculine becoming on screen now? And then they, they kill them. Oh, man. I think that it's, so you guys must have heard about this phenomenon that why do people look so much younger today than if you roll back time, you know, look at look at faces back from the 70s, from the 60s. Yeah, and you look this, at the cast of Cheers and they were all in their 30s and they looked about 50. Yeah. Like they just lived a different life then. Yeah. And there's a great video by Vsauce where he analyzes this when you because if you go back to uh, your book photos from the 1950s, you know, these 18 year old boys, they look like straight up men, you know, grown men, and they have very sort of mature looks to their face. And he does a full analysis of why that's the case that we all look so much younger now. But I think one, one of the biggest reasons is that life was much harder back then than it is now. And the way life ages a person, depending on what they see, if they have a very soft, cushy life, um, you can see the difference on a person's face. And, you know, I like even in, in Lion King, they show that. They show when Simba is this is young, he's like, he's like grown into his full size, mm -hmm. but he has this look on his face. It's very dopey. He's very immature. You can see that. But when he has a couple of battles and he like comes into his own and his responsibility, then his face changes. It hardens. It looks closer to his father's face. He has that same level of determination that his father did. And I think that that's what happened to men a lot more. When, when you look at someone like Gary Cooper, you look at um, Clint Eastwood, all these, all these actors, Rock Hudson, you can see that sort of grit built into their face. Yes, they were good looking, but there was also that, what, what you guys are talking about, that the psychological masculinity, you could feel the strength radiating just from their gaze. And I think that that's definitely missing from Hollywood, but I think in general, it's it's really gone away from our society. Yes, I mean, it's yeah. important to say that that's not exclusively a bad thing, um, given that if, if you if if hard, tough life experience ages people what we would now consider to be prematurely, then the fact that people now look so much younger, incidentally, also live quite a bit longer, suggests that we've made a little bit of progress. And actually, this is the sign of of comfort in society. We can actually afford to do things like skincare, for example, in the way that perhaps in the nineteen fifties you couldn't. We don't necessarily have to go off and fight wars in Korea in the same way that the nineteen fifties we did. <laughs> Like, there are good things to have come out of this modernity thing as well. That I, I think sometimes need to be stressed. There is, of course, like the, the old um, you thing about you know soft times creating weak when men, weak men creating hard times, and all the rest of that. And yeah. there is this anxiety, I suppose, that that maybe we're in the soft times period. But it, it, to drop some deep, deep, deep law, as in like ancient Greek law, there was actually a play uh, called I think it's Ecclesiastesai, uh, Aristophanes play, when basically the exact same um, point is being made that we are now arguing about or talking about at least which is that the premise is that a load of women um, dress up as men and they go and take over the Senate and they rule the city um, and they immediately institute effectively kind of sex communism where all the women get to sleep with whoever they want and everyone's equal, there's no capitalism, there's no private property. And Aristophanes is trying to satirize what at the time was perceived by certain people, I think in Athens, as being the excessive youthful womanliness of the caliber of the men of that city. So it comes in these recurring rounds, and we seem to sort of be in one of those anxiety stages at the moment. And you can see why, because we are not particularly well run as a society at the moment. So I can understand why people get a little bit uh, upset when they see seemingly immature people making terrible decisions for them. But um, I don't, yeah, I think you can go too far the other way in stressing the the importance and 
the greatness of, of old-fashioned manly civic virtue. I think that that comes with a lot of unpleasant side effects that we are quite well off without. I think we've also I, got oh, a decent selection of men still, right? Like, I assume, because Carl Urban, for example, is pretty awesome. Chris Pratt is still, they're both still working. They're both, in fact, names that might pop up in things that we'd be like, oh, shit, cool. Like, Carl Urban being in Mortal Kombat is like, oh, that's neat. Chris Pratt being... Chris Pratt as Mario will still be the funniest announcement like, ever. <laughs> um, you know, like Everyone Jason, lost their mind that day. I mean, like again, Chris Jason Pratt. Statham. Like, I, I wouldn't hold him up as a bastion of masculinity or anything. Like, he's, uh, you know, he's kind of a comedy actor, and he's trying his hand at drama, and he can play it to a degree. Really? And so I'm, I'm not going to take that away from him, but yeah, he's not. You don't he's think like it's Clint Eastwood of our right? time? If no, of course. Why would you compare it to like the madliest mad man? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, like Jason Statham, he's almost cartoonishly mad's bad, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, he's still around. Tom Hardy's still around doing stuff. Um, what do you think about Oscar Isaac? Someone like that? Yeah, I think he's uh, quite masculine. Yeah, they've done their best to, the, like in the Star Wars movies, the way they try to get this, him to be. This is oh, the yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. Like, when you see all... fucking Star Wars, <laughs> fucking um, what was that? That shitty um, Disney Plus show he was in, Moon Knight. Oh, Moon Knight. Yeah. Oh, Again, like, the, yeah, like I don't know mm. if it's his agent or whatever, but yeah, like Despot <laughs> says, they have done everything in their power to fucking like neuter his masculinity. Which well, is a shame uh, because in June, like that would that could have been so fucking iconic. Like the, his performance in June was great. Like he does play that yeah. that masculine ideal. Give him more of those roles. He could he in another age he the man would have been so an well. icon. And oh, he's, he's got the most epic June. fucking beard I think I've ever seen. Oh on yeah, man. like it just art. doesn't stop. Yeah. It grows well. <laughs> it just doesn't quit. But yeah, yeah. like I, I think he's he's fine. I just I'd like to see him in more roles that uh, play to that aspect. Oh, sure. of his well, all I'm getting at is that they still they're hiring him. He's still in stuff. And to be honest, like I said, he was my favorite part of Dune One. Um, but then then we've got the problem of they they miscast other characters into roles where you should have a hyper masculine actor. And I, I, I'm going to keep coming back to this. Fucking Pedro Pascal was horribly miscast in Last of Us. I, I'm just gonna say it. He he. Have, have you played the games? Because I I haven't played them, so I don't yes, have the serial comparison. How played does, how does played that, both of them, and he is not Joel. He's not Joel. I mean, I think um, I think the in terms of the general structure and like the the events that they cover, I think the season one of The Last of Us is a pretty good summary of the game. I think it does yeah. cover it really well. Um, I just don't think he or Bella Ramsey are good casting for their respective roles. And I just cannot buy him as a tough, rugged survivalist. He doesn't have that look about him. He doesn't have he doesn't embody that in his his performance or in his his personality. Didn't people and you're quite never like gonna you're never him. gonna get me sold on him. When he was Oberlin Martel in Game of Thrones though, wasn't he I mean he wasn't like the most masculine masculine character in the world, but he was, you know, skilled fighter, powerful, well, fight like rugged after a fashion. Fun. He no, but he was more of a flamboyant kind of. Um, okay, wait, stop. Stop. Fighter, but he didn't stop, stick. Stop, yeah. stop, stop! Let's slow right down. This is the problem. The hatred for Pedro Pascal has now bled into all of his work. <laughs> if we can remember, I'll give like, him his dues. Like he was pretty good in in Narcos. No, but then not just, I'm not even going to talk about that. Like Game of Thrones, he was fucking intense and intimidating. That was his role. He came to get revenge. He wanted to kill Tywin on the mountain. Yes. That was his explicit purpose. He was trying to fucking terrify everyone there. He was not yeah, flamboyant. The, well, the the point of his character is it didn't it wasn't about rugged masculinity. That was not what his character was. He was a man, it was a person who wanted revenge. That was essentially it but certainly intimidating, threatening, and he could hold yeah. his own, which was really impressive. Like, he could fight the mountain and win, which is beyond impressive. Obviously, his uh, ego he gets the better of him. Well, that's yeah. the thing, isn't it? He, he's so obsessed with getting uh, justice for his family that it ends up killing him, which is just standard Game of Thrones writing. But um, I don't know. I, I'd never be able to agree with horribly miscast. If you if we were talking about horribly miscast, we'd have fucking, like, Melissa McCarthy as Joel, you know? Like, the, that's that's the level no, I would scale I, yeah, at. But... I'd say um, he's I, like um I I've already I would happily concede I prefer Game Joel and I don't think they're the same character show Joel and uh, uh Game Joel but the I think he did a really good job some of the scenes where not only is he acting his heart out but also the scenes where he's torturing people or killing people like I think he pulls off the intimidation just fine um Bella Ramsey nah. I 
okay. <laughs> I, mean, well, I mean, sorry, like, I, I know this just comes down to a matter of personal preference, but I, 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 whenever I see him doing things like that, I see um, an actor trying to play the role of a tough guy rather than uh, a person who actually naturally fits into that role. He he doesn't he doesn't embody that. For what do you me. think of him as Oberyn then? As Oberyn, I thought he was good. Yeah, I mean, like um, he uh, again for playing that character, for playing a guy who was obsessed with just getting revenge, takes it too far. His ego gets the better of him, and ultimately, um, you know, gets undone by it. His Fine. first scene, he uh, tries to scare off and intimidate two Lannisters just with his voice, his presence, and then he stabs one of them with a, a dagger. Do you remember? I don't actually remember that. I, it has been I a recommend. While. I would need. I would need it. to rewatch it. Yeah, because I don't know. I, 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 watching all of his scenes as Oberyn is fun. Like as a rewatch, and right before Game of Thrones went to shit, because he does a really good job. Um, what else would there be? Like, I, I, th I have a feeling that we've reflexively elastic banded, and we hate him way more than he deserves, just because he keeps popping up and everything. Because Hollywood wants to hire him for everything. Like, um, he's getting retconned. I don't, well, this is the thing. His role as Oberyn was fantastic. Like I knew the character because I'd read the books already, and I was very apprehensive about them getting it right. And I didn't know him, um, except for like, you know, cameos in places. But I was like, shit, this guy nailed it. It is and, a fascinating uh, psychological phenomenon when fans psychologically, or when fans retcon something that they used to like in the past because of something new, like with uh, Drinker and Ghostbusters. Because when I saw <laughs> Ghostbusters Afterlife, I thought. I, I kind of reluctantly thought it was shit. I wanted to like it because I hated Ghostbusters 16 so much and, and, and I felt this movie's heart was in the right place, but um, I never liked it. I was almost ashamed of the fact that I that I disliked it. And now I, I like the fact that I hate it, you know, because the new <laughs> movie's such garbage. Well, and I don't blame anybody. You know, like Kevin Spacey, if someone says like, I fucking hate the movies he's a part of now, I'd be like, that's fair. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't really blame you for that, you know? Uh, but if, uh, and that's the other thing. If someone said like, well, he pisses me off because I think about the things he said in real life, I'd be fine with that too. But I don't want to take away from his abilities as an actor. Um, but I mean, American Beauty is never going to stop being a brilliant film, and he's never going that the, the performance by him is never going to be anything other than excellent. Well, Kevin Spacey's amazing at playing villains. Gotta go wonder on that one. I do I like this one. <laughs> Pedro Pascal's a male Millie Bobby Brown. They keep trying to shove him <laughs> into everything. No, but I I think Pedro can act, and she can scream, and that's the different thing. <laughs> she, no, she can scream and she can cry. She command. can cry, that's true. And like, wow, they, they really make use of that and everything that she's in. But yeah, Pedro, oh, it's a frustrating one. I know he's a good actor, but I know that there's certain things that naturally fit his personality better. And it's not everything. And Joel isn't one of them. Um, and I feel like... About, was, he was cast as Mr. In the Fantastic, Fantastic. Four. What do you yeah. think of that? I don't know at this point, but I, I think it kind of bleeds into that general Pascal fatigue that I'm feeling, where I'm just like, yeah, of course, I guess you were going to cast him because he's in fucking everything. Um, I think it's probably better suited to his sensibilities and as an actor than someone like Joel. Uh, I just I'm not particularly enthusiastic about seeing him because I'm not enthusiastic about seeing him in really I anything right now. I never would have cast him as Mr. Fantastic. One, because I don't think he's quite right for it. Two, nobody wants to see him right now. He's been in too much stuff. They need to put him on the shelf for a little bit. And then, I don't know, three, like, there's the other actors I think should have been given a shot for this that suited it way better. Would have been, you know, like, because, like, the whole Krasinski got the, the famous fan cast, and then he got killed five seconds after. Oh. It's like, what was that about, Marvel? That's still frustrating because you knew they blew their shot with that. Like, okay, you've done him in an alternate universe, so now you can't realistically cast him as yeah. the actual legit one. And it's just like, ah, I just felt like a giant fuck you to the fans. But, well, that's a whole other conversation. The the, the, the idea of Marvel even mattering at this point is fucking irrelevant. <laughs> like, it's just done. The, the whole universe is just done with that. Um, yeah. I, 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 I struggle to even summon up an emotion about Marvel at this point. Do you think Marvel are yeah. in the same... Like, would you compare them to Lucasfilm? Whereas, like, Lucasfilm is dead, it's in the ground, it's buried. Would you say Marvel is at that level? It's, Somewhat. It's I mean, a you know, hollow shell of a franchise where, like, there's this superficial veneer that it still matters in the sense that, like, 
they probably still got a slate of films and yeah, you know they yeah. can still claim that they're still making stuff and it's got the the momentum of what it once was but there's I nothing they, behind it now there's no heart they might have a bit more power left in the you know the engine than uh star wars cuz you know like deadpool and wolverine that's going to get a lot of eyes on it the next avengers no matter what it is people will be like oh but it'll be terrible and then that'll be it like the, you know they got their one shot with avengers cuz i've done it in so long that'll be that for that ip but uh star wars is like fucked it's just absolutely fucked yeah, they've wasted yeah. everything and announcing to the public in any way shape or form that gets them aware of it that you're getting a ray movie next it's like oh you guys <laughs> that's are... hilarious what a what a move i mean are you excited for pedro pascal <clears throat> in the mandalorian and grogu Can't will he be more? in it <laughs> like, are we sure he's even in it at this point I mean, the more relevant question is who cares? But um, mm. yeah, like if, if if it was, I guess you'd get his voice, like recording from his fucking villa somewhere. Um, <laughs> you know, like half heartedly, like, uh, what are you doing, Grogu? You need to stop that. Oh God! Like whatever you're doing, you stop it. Yeah. This is the way. I, well, don't I, don't forget, the help me, help me, Ahsoka. <laughs> Thank you, Ahsoka. Oh, gee, good thing you were here, Ahsoka. <laughs> Yeah, I a couple of weeks ago I went to Disneyland, and for my friend who's a big Star Wars fan, he of of the original series, he I have to specify that uh, he had not been to Star Wars Land before, so it was his first time, and I had to just warn. He loved it, but I had to warn him. I'm like, there are no legacy characters being represented. There's no Luke, there's no Han, there's no Princess Leia. It's all about. Ray, 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 Ray. That's right. it. I'm sure if you went and, outside, yeah. though, you could have found a homeless person to represent Luke. And that's <laughs> this place is really like. Just hand there him was some a green, lot of green milk, milk and be like, here, yeah. here, drink this. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of green milk, but no Luke to be seen, unfortunately. <laughs> Lucasfilm, that's... if you're listening, Jabba the Hutt's Palace and Casino in Vegas. Make it happen. Oh, that would be choice, oh, yeah. yes. That All would... the women are dressed as slave Leia. Mm. Perfect. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. That that would make billions. I'm not it even... It honestly kidding. would. It would. That's the funny I, thing. I, like, I people would flock to it. <laughs> How could you not? Like, You'd be like, yeah, I got to go to that. They, could, do die, like, you know? they could even do mini TV shows and stream it whereby they have auditions for the waitresses to play slave Leia and they get really well paid and they get amazing tips. Women would flock to that for that job. <laughs> I, I think it'd be fascinating to, like, have two of those places like one like open next to each other like every everyone's dressed as slave leia in one and in the other one everyone's dressed up as ray <laughs> just yeah. see what the public just decides talk with yeah. their tips yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> let, let, we live in a democracy after all at least a nominal democracy let the people decide yeah Oh god, it's so funny to talk about Star Wars now because it's transitioned from <laughs> pop culture phenomenon to thing that we're really contentious over to a meme to it's just, just joke. It's, it, it's joke. inert. It's like when a star's burned out and it's just like the fucking blackened core at the end of it. That's what it is now. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's kind of hilarious that, that that it's even a thing that people talk about anymore. And a staple of mine, whenever I'm having a particularly hard day, I turn on Mr. Plinkett's review of the of the prequels. Yeah. And I haven't yeah. watched it in a really long time. And I was I was listening to it and I was like, wow, we are in a, such a different state now where people the prequels are really not looked at like this poorly anymore, which is so strange. Well, did you get to the part where he recommends that JJ Abrams take over Star Wars? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when he oh, does a review. Plinkett. And when he does a review of of uh, the Force Awake, not is it the Force Awaken the f number seven? Seven. seven? Yeah, yeah, the Force Awakens. Force Awakens, right? Um, he says, "Oh, it's interesting to see JJ taking a lot of the criticisms into account that I had done of the prequels." So he's, I, he's yeah. right. I think he regrets a lot of the things yeah. he said because I remember when they got back from the the movie theater that it was like a really like quick off the cuff review of Force Awakens. Yeah. And it's like, Mike, what do you think? And he's like, I fucking loved it. It was everything I hoped it would be. Yep. Yeah. It's like, oh, that didn't well, that age was, well. It, it kind of did age well in the sense of it's a great little t uh, capstone, of a uh, 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 time capsule of what happened back then. It's like, JJ really tricked a lot of people, all right? Uh, yeah. I'm one of them. I, I, was, I was really like, this worked. This was good. So that, you, you, that veil Same comes here. down. 
Um, but something interesting about that as well is the you know sayings like "aha." They listen to the criticisms of uh, you know don't put politics in Star Wars because that's what the prequels did and that's bad. And you can trace these things somewhat um, to the point where it's like active damage to the uh, the sequels because like they are, they were so averse to world building in any way, shape, or form that it like absolutely annihilated any sense of what the hell's even happening in the world. They were like, we can't touch uh, a Senate meeting. No, like we can't do that. That, that, that will remind people of the prequels when, um, as you said, it's really funny to think about nowadays because you fast forward just a selection amount of years and they are back in the Senate and they are evoking the prequels as much as they can, which is uh, a big change in the times. Cause yes, if uh, Gary always references this, but the first line in Force Awakens is "This will begin to make things right." Yes. Yeah. Meaning, the, the prequels. Know. The prequels fucked it all up, guys. The prequels. That's what it was. Such an innocent time. Yeah. Like we were, we were so naive back then. We were so easily duped. You know, uh, come on, save us, JJ. You can do it. We believe in you. And then look where we ill placed faith. Ended up. Yeah. It does go I mean, both ways as well, because you get quite a few people that say, no, 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 the prequels were really good. At least they weren't the sequels. And no, no, just the sequels being shit doesn't make the prequels good, all right? It just means yeah. that like maybe some people were too harsh on them at the time, but they are not particularly good films. I, the, the same people, I will still get comments on my Indiana Jones video to this day <laughs> saying, actually, Crystal Skull was good. Crystal no, it wasn't. Oh, really no, wasn't a good no, film. no, no. And just yeah. because Indy 5 is worse does not make it a good film either. So it's like, be consistent. This, I mean, this just, is just the, the dialogue... Desperate. Between Anakin and uh, and uh, Padme is just so clunky. It's actually incredibly awkward. You know when, and it's that, supposed to be the greatest think, like, love George, story. George Lucas has never like talked to another human being in his life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's like what it feels like. You guys have. I wish chat. that I could wish my feelings away for you. Oof. That was a line, you guys. Like it just—it was so bad. No, it's because I'm so in love with you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a senator. She's just over and over. <laughs> I'm a senator. We just can't. Why? <laughs> you can get Tom, though, right? You Everybody can't take it from me. <laughs> He's right about that. You turned her against me. <laughs> You've you have done, done that, that yourself. yourself. Ooh, sick burn, Obi Wan, you motherfucker! <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said burn in that context. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> too soon. Too soon. <laughs> I hate you. You brought him here to kill me. <laughs> he and then the to, no. When he the said, no. "I hate you." He might have been talking to the sand on the planet, like when he said, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> you're rough and coarse and you're getting everywhere. <laughs> it's all my exposed wounds. I think, honestly, I think maybe the Obi-Wan Kenobi show might have equaled that in terms of retarded dialogue. Where it's I, like, I, oh, I, I still, way more than the prequels. To this oh, yeah. day, I still say that Obi-Wan Kenobi show is the worst thing that Disney Lucasfilm has done. So I think choice. it might be. I think it might be. Uh, that includes because, everything. Like, well, Obi Wan and Anakin were like the last bastions of Star Wars that hadn't been bent over a table and ass raped, and like that was it. That was the they they took them then, and they did it without mercy, and they didn't use lube, and it was painful for all of us, and that's that was it. That was the last of it. Oh, have you come um, here to destroy me? No. Yeah. No, you Follow didn't. Me. You just fucking you landed don't... here. <laughs> uh, I'm, it was, it's not just the, the wretchedness of the script. It's just it's so appallingly directed. I think it's a good a good example of just DEI gone wrong. It, it's the TV equivalent of a Boeing jet falling out of the sky. because It is one of the only examples I can think of where they use shaky cam on a distant shot. It's There's just... the scene when they're fighting and then the camera is several miles away from them fighting and it's still shaking. <laughs> and I don't just, know oh, how how never... photography is disgusting. Like It's so dark and pretentious and neo-noir and just fucking I'll horrible never... to look at. I think the scene that scarred me for the rest of my life with cinema was the laser gate where like obi-wan has to turn it <laughs> off and it's like there's fucking nothing for about 10 miles on either side of it you could just walk around it, it, it i mean also, it's like hot shots level of stupidity like this this has got to be a parody right oh right no this is a serious tv show wow <laughs> i don't even know what to say
Meanwhile, Luke of... is just like eating paste in the corner. Oh, like, no one cares oh, about oh. him. Chat, leave her alone, okay? She's making funny jokes. I agree with them. <laughs> Girl, we mad at you. Leave Lucas alone. I've seen people say, like, to be fair, the OT had some bad lines. Like, don't even try. Like, <laughs> compare the dialogue quality of the OT and the prequels. Yeah, there is no good I, mean, I love the prequels. You know, I love democracy. It, it's like they are innately memeable things. Um, they are lovely, and the thing that you can say differentiates them absolutely between them and anything that Disney Star Wars has done is that for all they fail massively in delivery, they, at least they are trying to do something. At least they have a relatively ish coherent vision. Um, at least they are very clearly Star Wars. They have that nebulous feels like Star Wars quality to them. I still love them. I find them hard to watch at times, but I still love them. But that doesn't mean that they're good. And everything after them being shit doesn't mean that they're good either. It just means that they are they are sort of charming and incompetent, but well meaning. You could yeah. compare the prequels they, they to are... like a yeah, well, I'm, I was you can compare them to like a bad album that has a few cracking songs on it. Like for example, even episode one, which is a bad movie, it still has the the, the Jewel of Fates, which is amazing. Ooh. The music in it is incredible. Mm. The, the pod really, race, like, I love the pod race. The pod it does race. have these, it's like... it just has these absolute these sort of movie equivalents of just banger tracks on an otherwise crap album. Yeah. It's funny because it's like the the soundtracks great, the special effects, I think they were great for their time. Mm. Um the the actors generally were really good. I mean, Hayden choreography. Yeah, co fight choreography, really good. The thing that fucking kills them is just the shit scripts. <laughs> like, that's literally <laughs> it. That's the, the little problem. Anakin's like, yippee! Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's like, <laughs> the, the prequels are like your, your fucking drunken granddad, like, uh, trying to dance to Beyonce at a wedding or something. Oh, like, it's know. it's goofy and it's embarrassing, but it's like, he's just doing his best and he means well. <laughs> Whereas the... The sequel trilogy is like some creepy guy, uh, of, like that, like accosts you outside the school gates and goes, "Hey, little boy, I've got some puppies in my van. Do you want to come and see?" <laughs> like that's the difference of it. Oh, yeah. It's just like there's there's good yeah. intent gone wrong, and then there's like horrible intent that just goes even worse. That's that's the big difference. Yeah. That's why like people will just never warm to those sequels. They'll never do it. There's a nostalgia factor with the prequels for sure. You're never going to get that with the sequels. I, I mean, think I say George that now, Lucas, maybe. Yeah, but I maybe think twenty George... years from now, like our fucking children will be like, "Oh yeah, I remember well, the, the, the sequels." The Ray movie will come out, right? Nah, and everyone will start saying the sequels weren't that bad because the Ray yeah, movie. Yeah, maybe. Right. <laughs> That's right. How long have we got to wait? It'd be from ninety nine to two thousand five was the prequel era. So like mm. twenty years from twenty fifteen to nineteen, we can finally say, "There you go. They're still hated." <laughs> it's no different. I'll be dead by then. I'll be fine. So yeah, I'll make. A, I'll attach you to a IV of Jack Daniels to make sure you uh, you can make it. You know, gotta, <laughs> just, so I can, you just so I can live long enough to be like, ah, oh, they were shit. Do people still say this shit? It's like, yes, yes, they do. You're like, oh. <laughs> good. Now I can go. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Let's do a few super chats while we're here. Well, because people have asked us questions, and we should answer some of them. Because we found like, out, by the way, the reboot in scary movie now. Oh, for fuck's sake! It wasn't bad enough the first time. <laughs> Doing another one, and apparently it's going to be out next year. <sighs> They're rebooting it. They're not just doing like scary movie six or well, something. Uh, Paramount Minimax are uh, making a new take on the franchise and expect to go before the cameras Jesus in Christ. the fall. Paramount revealed Cinema they're, Con on Thursday. They're, they're remaking a party which was kind of shit to begin with and has and has aged quite. You badly. take that back, I'm, guess what? You take that back. <laughs> scary <laughs> movie take, one was fucking great. I'm funny. not taking it back. One and three. I love the, them. the sex scene where he's screaming like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> <laughs> No, all right. When she That'll gets blasted, when she gets blasted into the ceiling with the gigantic <laughs> fire I'm hose not, of cum, that's I'm not all kidding. Right. That's one not of my bad. favorite scenes in comedy of all time is the <laughs> giant staircase where she's running away from him. It, it goes on forever. It's huge. <laughs> yeah. and, like the, she throws grandma at that. <laughs> 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 That shit was lovely. Oh, but how creatively bankrupt and plagiaristic do you have to be to remake a parody of a twenty-five-year-old movie? Like, that's it's just bizarre. It, it, it is. I mean, the barrel, why even? Right? Why even? Like I no, say, why even remake the, 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 
Why even like remake it? Why not just say and pretending it's a barrel? <laughs> they scrape through the barrel into the floor. <laughs> Why not just make scary movie, I don't know, four or five or whatever it is now and just say, like, right now we're gonna parody modern horror movies. It's fine, you don't have to remake yeah. it. Yeah. Because like well, the I... things like if they were to try and remake the first scary movie, it's referencing Scream, a, f- a film that's like it was that out when I was be... in high school. That could be how it works. They remake it, but it has... I don't even know if they can bring back any of the original actors or any <laughs> storylines. They might just call it Scary Movie, and now it's a parody of all the new horror films, maybe. You don't know. Just, Did anybody no. see The Exorcist Believer? No. Jeez, I heard it was all cool. right, right. It's terrible. Oh, really? Yeah, who did you hear it was okay from? <laughs> I've already heard it's bad. Oh, no, I'm thinking of The Omen. Sorry. Ah. Um, that is no, also not was, great. I watched all the Razzies movies, and my god, that was an experience. <laughs> you um, watched all the Razzies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do it every That's year. Brave of as, you. as a as a can and you, you'd be shocked how bad they're like it's it's another experience, man. It's another level. Uh but the Exorcist Believer was so shit. I, I'll not go into it, but my god, it was bad. Like that kind of shit needs parody, you know? And it made tons of money and they're gonna make another one. By the way, your vi- your video about the Me Too f- film was so good. She that was said? hilarious. She said, "There you go." Oh yeah, was, yeah, that was a good. That one. was. I loved your analysis of it. It was. I was just cracking up. Well done. Thanks I liked your one for for women talking as well, where it was just like you just <laughs> went in hard on that movie. <laughs> that, <laughs> just... that, that is that is such. It's it's so sadistic that movie. It's it's like really ultra hardcore feminism, and it got two hundred and twenty awards nominations, and it won I think eighty six awards, and it. I, wow. It's just this weird psychological phenomenon whereby everybody in Hollywood was terrified to call bullshit on this absolutely horrible movie. Yep. Um, let me bring a couple Sounds of ones right. up here. Uh, Darius White said, Indy 5 and the sequel trilogy are like the ugly wingmen to Crystal Skull and prequels. You bring them along when you want to be more appealing by comparison. By the way, I need more <laughs> Canto Bite Manager versus Defenseless Slave Child banter from Mahler. <laughs> <laughs> we, that was fucking me and as we went back and forth for like an hour making jokes about that. That was that was funny. Uh, yeah, just you know the the happenings over at Canto Bite. It's always been a source for comedy because of how inept Rose and Finn would have been in their goals on that planet, and how much worse they would have made it for literally every living thing on that planet, except oh, the yeah, rich. For sure. Yeah, yeah. It's not true. They saved the rabbit horses, and she explicitly <laughs> told us that now it's worth it. So <laughs> no, it's not how it works. <laughs> What's going to happen to those poor animals? They can't survive. They're domesticated. <laughs> It'd be like if I fucking turned my greyhounds loose in the wilds of Scotland and just said, all right, good luck, guys. See you later. They'd be either dead within they, about an hour. Either they die or they're recaptured. It's like the only two options. That's all that's going to happen. <laughs> fucking movie. Ah, anyway, sorry. Metal Face Rosie said, Chris Raygun recently said DEI is good because Elaine was added to Seinfeld because execs thought the show would benefit from having a female in the main cast. How has Chris gotten so dumb? I don't know, actually. How? How indeed. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a great take. Um, Chuxenhausen said, so glad I found your channel five years ago. Cheers. Thanks, man. Um, Metal Face Rosie says multiple hit pieces on Drinker in the last few months, and Mauler wasn't even mentioned in the Hello Future Me video. Step up your game, long man. I gotta, I gotta make some more videos. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll forget yeah, that. you're a, you're a woke bro, little platoon. I hope you know that. Mm. <laughs> I am, I am aware of this. Yes, I was surprised <laughs> EFAP didn't make it in though, just because like, EFAP's like the citadel of bigots, right? Like everyone's been on yeah. there being you evil. You at least. A cameo, like hmm. you know, some reference, an Easter egg, you know, it's just something. But no, I have yeah. corresponded with the guy about. So like, I've, I've not actually checked, but I think he has replied. But like, briefly, because obviously he's taken down the half of the bit, the video in question. Um, I think it implicitly implied that at least he made a mistake with respect to at least a couple of people. Um, so I said that, that I'm assuming that I'm one of them. But I, I trust me, I can convince you that that Drinker and Gary from the Rodic are good people as well. So we'll have a chat at some point. Oh. But um, he seems slightly apologetic, so that's a start. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's... No, fair play. I mean, it's a good, it's a real sign of like um, integrity when you quietly delete the parts of the video that you're getting heat for, but <laughs> leave the the rest of the video up. Just uh, but like, yeah, good going, man. Not trying to 
ruin any potential bridges here, but I'm just saying, how do you make that mistake if you look through... Like, he had to get the reference of you saying that surrounded by all this other stuff that doesn't fit into his POV at all. So, what happened? Yeah, and there's, there's the other side is that it apparently caused him a lot of anxiety or something, which is another reason for taking it down. Um, I, I did it. Well, I'll, I'll have a chat. We'll find out what, what the Very truth well. happens to me. Oh, good luck with that one. Hope it hope it turns out well. Um, but yeah, as for the hit pieces, I don't know, man. Um, like I guess I was on Piers Morgan a couple of times, so <laughs> that brings an extra level of attention. Um, and suddenly people get angry that you're doing well. You know, it's just your typical typical online stuff, I suppose. Um, and I just allow it to roll over me because, for the most part, I just don't care. <laughs> I'm not on that much. I'm not online that much. Well, it's um, funny you've, I've had a few requests of you, like, you're going to cover it? You're going to cover any of these videos? It's like, we don't cover every anti-drink video. <laughs> like, there's a lot of those. Too many. The fact <laughs> is, we're trying to keep up with the stuff we wanted to cover. But um, some of these videos are, like, embarrassing. Where it'll just be like, you know, he doesn't like the new this movie. That means he hates women. He's just like, ah, oh, I'm all right. <laughs> like, we'll, we'll find someone else to talk about. It'll be more interesting. It, it's the thing that happens, and I don't want to sound like a fucking like, oh, I'm a big deal now or whatever, but like, I guess when any person gets to a certain level of notoriety, um, you know, other people would just want to ride their coattails. And it's like, well, I can just make a movie or I can make a video with a critical drinker in the title and it'll get me a certain number of views because there's just general interest in, in that YouTuber. Um, and it's just, that's just, that's the YouTube ecosystem right there, yeah. you know. Um, true. Uh, Stephen Bobo says, "Drinker, I saw Joe Rogan. A couple of people on his podcast were talking about Star Wars and how um, Disney cuck the male heroes. I mean, good, you know. Um, I guess anything to raise awareness of how shit the writing is in Star Wars these days. It feels like um, everyone scene. on Earth agrees about Finn at least. You know, like, it's reached." It has reached cultural saturation, though. If you look at the like to dislike ratio on the Acolyte trailer, mm. it's not just guys on YouTube complaining about Star Wars everywhere. Everyone knows now that Star Wars is a pathetic husk, that it's it's garbage, it's a joke. Everybody think, basically believes it's that that uh, South Park meme. It's it's now popular consensus. Yeah. It, it's become like it's socially acceptable to mock it now, and I think that's when you've crossed the line where it just it it's become that just cultural lol cow which i'm fully on board with because it deserves it um <clears throat> uh metal face rosie says have any of you seen avenue q or book of mormon i've seen both of them and they're both really funny i heartily recommend them especially book of mormon that's fucking brilliant i got tickets um, to see that when it was on its first ever run and i didn't check the date that i'd bought them for um, and it turned out I turned up on the wrong day, so I couldn't get in. Otherwise, oh, I might have sure. a musical that I liked. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, if anything's going to win you over, Book of Mormon would probably do it. It's fantastic. Um, Trey Parker's a brilliant songwriter. It's, it's, mm -hmm. He often gets overlooked for that, but like South Park, what about Bigger, Longer, and Uncut? Have you seen South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut? I almost like refuse to call it a musical just because I, I kind of like it. But... It's, it's brilliant. <laughs> it's a masterpiece. I swear to God, I must, I, I, I must do a video on that. It's a absolute masterpiece of a movie, mm -hmm. and the songs are brilliant. Um, he also says, what's your favorite musical panel? Uh, you can't say bigger, longer, and uncut. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best musical. No, it is, though. It is. Uh, because I, I think... Go ahead, Trinker. Yeah, I think Book of Mormon might be mine, actually. Um, I was just thinking, is it counted as a musical, uh, Team America? No, that's not a musical. <laughs> there are many good songs. There, there are songs in it, but it's not a musical. Yeah. But like, there's slightly more songs than a, just a <laughs> film with songs in it. You know what I mean? Fuck off! What are you doing? Cop out bullshit. It's like it's got a couple of songs in it, so it's got, every, it's got more than the average. So it's a has musical. AIDS. Brilliant, good right? Song. The song that uh, Kim Jong Il sing, sings himself, "I'm So Ronery." That's that was really good just song. an epic freedom classic. don't come freedom free. isn't free. That's a good song. Yep. There's, if there's if so Team America classics. is a musical, then I like musicals, but I don't like <laughs> musicals. So. <laughs> oh, God, America, I'm start calling. fuck yeah! <laughs> now I've seen everything. Really? Have you seen a man eat his own head? <laughs> no. Well, then I guess haven't seen everything. 
<laughs> Neither have we. Uh, what was the other one? Um, Kay Kaylee Fall says, I saw Monkey Man in the theaters two days ago and it kicked ass. If you haven't seen it yet, please do yourself a favor. Anyone seen Monkey Man yet? I've not seen it. I've heard very good no. things, though. Apparently, it's pretty cool. It's Dev Patel that directed it, wasn't it? Yeah. Stars and the stars. Away. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I'm going to watch it. I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, it's going to be good. Um, Metal Face Rosie says, Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, Heath Ledger's final film, also starred Tom uh, Waits, an inspiration for Ledger's Joker. Tom Waits did the vocals for the Primus song, Tommy the Cat. Moller, listen to Primus. Hmm. There you go. You've been commanded to do so. It's a bit shit that that was his final film, actually. The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Oh, well. Um, John Gates says, Anyone see the top 20 character list from video games? Here's my top five. One, Tifa's chest. Two, Eve from Stella Braid's ass. Uh, three, Chun-Li's thighs. Four, Jill Valentine's tube <laughs> top. And five, Lara Croft's short shorts. I mean, that's a pretty good list, to be fair. Um, yeah, the, the top 20 video game characters. Oh, fucking what did they put? They put Lara Croft at the top, I'm pretty sure. Um, Wait, was that the iconic characters from video games list? Yes. Yeah, sorry, she ain't the number one. There's no way. No. Um, yeah, it's going to be someone like Mario or something, isn't it? Gotta be. I'll put Sonic before her. I don't even like that blue fuck. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, this is, yeah. Uh, it was Lara Croft, Mario, Agent 47, Sonic the Hedgehog, Sackboy, Pac-Man, Link, Master Chief, Kratos, Shadowheart, Arthur Morgan, Pikachu, Steve, Minecraft, Steve from Minecraft, Solid Snake, Crash Bandicoot, Cloud Strife, Asterion, um, Kazuma Kiryu, and Ellie Williams. Is Sackboy really above Master no. Chief? I don't. I don't know where the fuck that came from. No, I, nobody. Sack, Sackboy has disappeared because nobody really cares about Little Big Planet anymore. Well, yeah. yeah, like that was a thing for like six months, and that was it. It's a shit list. <laughs> Agent, I, yeah, Agent Forty Seven. I would not have put him in like the top three. Like maybe in the top twenty, but like nowhere near the top. Who's the most iconic Grand Theft Auto character? Trevor. Mm -hmm. Trevor. I mean, in terms of just like the the one that everyone quotes and the one that's like most entertaining, probably Trevor. I'm trying Three, to be sure because I think a couple could be in the running for that, right? Like, what do I hear tr quoting GTA characters? The I was like, hmm. what's uh, what's what's chat got? CJ is getting a lot of. Yeah, there were some brilliant um, characters in San Andreas. Nico Bellic. Really? I mean, he was good, but like I would I would put Trevor above him in terms of just like how interesting or funny he is, how entertaining he is. Quite a few CJs. Yeah. That makes sense though with generations, because the thing about it, isn't Grand Theft Auto five like is it the most selling like singular It is the piece biggest of media? selling piece of media in history. Because it's been re-released re like 15 times at this well, point. Well, that yeah. is a result of how popular it is, though, right? They would re-release it if not for everyone buying the fucking... I it. know, but the, there does come a point where it's like, okay, this is fucking obnoxious now. Like, what, <laughs> how much you're milking this one game. Like, Jesus <clears throat> Christ. Don't worry, Drinker, we're getting GTA 6 soon enough. Yay! Yeah. The, the, <laughs> the carefully toned down, um, culturally sensitive edition. I can't wait for that. Um... Metal Face Rosie says, Jeeves and Wooster is a great show. It actually is, yeah. I, I never, like, in the great pantheon of British comedy, I keep forgetting about Jeeves and Wooster, but it was good fun. I liked it. Um, Jimmy Dante says, Hail Drinker, great panel tonight. What inspired you to write your first novel, and what was the most rewarding or exciting moment of your writing career? I mean, that one's, like, pretty easy. It would be the first time I got my very first publishing deal. That was a tense day because my agent told me that they were going to go meet with one of the publishers. They wanted to talk to them. Um, they were hopeful that something would happen. And I was just waiting all day long to hear from them. And they didn't phone me until fucking six o'clock at night. <laughs> um, so that was uh, that was a long day for me. But they, they gave me the news. And it's like, yeah, we've got you a three book publishing deal. 
um, and that was that was pretty fucking cool. That was a, a bit of a vindication for a couple of years of work and waiting. So that was a very yeah. good feeling. Yeah. Um, and as for right, uh, my inspiration, it was just I don't know. As, as goofy as it sounds. I just really always enjoyed storytelling. I enjoyed the process of it. I enjoyed the the free imagination of it. Um, and I always wanted to do it, I suppose. And um, it always seemed like this unattainable goal, like writing a novel, that's that's for smart people to do. I can't do that. And eventually I, like, I got around to doing it myself and um, realized, yeah, it can be done. Actually, it is something that you can do. And um, yeah, I'm glad I did, I suppose. So. Anyway, that's my sappy story out of the way. <laughs> Ghost of Drinker's Liver says, thanks for 90 years of open bars. Here's hoping we're all around for the centennial. I know, it's been quite the quite the 90 years, like nine decades of this. Molly, you know, we've been out this- again, just taking two years off so casually. That's what, that's what happens on this show, you know? But with yeah. The- we do not perceive time in the same way that you mortals do. So, you know, it's different yeah. for us. It's all dog uh, ears. <laughs> yeah, crazy. one show per year. The amount of catching up we got to do. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's roughly the rate at which you release videos, Mauler. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't it be terrible thing to like you do one show a year and it's an hour on Godzilla X Con? <laughs> Every year. <laughs> <laughs> Gives us plenty of time to think of new material. You know, there's other aspects of this film that I want to. Yeah, cover. there are other I, Godzilla movies. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I feel like I could do an entire like hour long special on just like Godzilla's tooth subplot. <laughs> or, no, sorry, um, Kong's tooth. Um, yeah, there's deep meaning there. Um, Canada Plus says, "Hail panel, any plans to review the Fallout show?" That's just Guardians. Ah. Five stars. Five stars. Oh, the Guardian. Has anyone that's... here seen any of it? Episode one, yes. What's it like? Episode one as well. What's it like? I'm very curious. Do you want to go first, Platoon? Yeah. Okay. Um. I I I didn't hate it. That's the start. Um. I I actually really like the beginning. I think the beginning is probably the strongest bit. Then I think some of the the city action starts slightly weighing against a tone and b good sense. And I don't particularly like jumping around, certainly in your first episode, between effectively multiple POVs in multiple parts of the world because it, it destroys any concept of like or prospect of mystery. Um, however, I think like it looks great. Some of the performances are okay. Some of them are a little bit, eh. um, and I'm interested to see where it goes. So I, that's automatically basically a good review because it hasn't alienated me after one episode. So you know, better than most things at the moment. There, now that we've done the nice side. Uh, I, I did not like it really at all to the point where I won't be continuing it. I was thinking about doing coverage with the lads, but uh, I got bored out of my mind by the time I'd hit the credits for the first one. I think there's a huge amount of lost potential from even the first scene. I was already uh, picking up things just like, oh, why the fuck did they do that instead of this, 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 this? Not necessarily adaptation stuff, but I do think that Fallout fans are currently having a huge war. The new fans versus the old fans versus fans of the show. Um, there's a funny post. I'm just going to read you the title of it on the Fallout subreddit. The show does not break the law. They just explained it poorly. Uh, <laughs> okay. So That's like, one way to look at it, I suppose. Um, Do you think it breaks lore? Uh, I'm not as familiar with Fallout to be able to make the claim, but I've seen arguments from people. That I was like, oh, shit, that's going to piss Fallout fans off, especially New Vegas fans. Um, the things that broke it for me, funnily enough, were kind of a little bit in opposition to what Platoon was saying. I actually did not like the introduction. I thought they were screwing up everything in terms of getting a new viewer into understanding the world of Fallout and the vault systems. I thought we wasted time. I thought everyone during the event that happens near the beginning in the first, let's say, third is is very incompetently done by both factions. Yeah. Um, I was struggling to pay attention, seeing everyone be hyper-retarded. That's and then, the bit I meant when I said like the, the, the silliness of the action sort of contradicts the sense. To, to be clear though, on the, the beginning, I meant specifically the first scene, but then tying oh, that right, into okay, the, okay. tying that into the criticism of it of it jumping around between POV shots, like I would really have loved to see uh, the oh, entire first episode being in the before times and the entire second episode being introducing the vault, and the entire third episode being introducing something else, as opposed to five minutes of each. And then like because I I'm not familiar at all with Fallout lore. Like I love the world setting. It looks amazing. Like I, I'm a sucker for post-apocalyptic stuff. I think the 1950s yeah. tech stuff is great. I just want to actually spend a bit more time in all of this before we got start sort of jumping around on disconnected at the moment adventures. 
Um, something they did. I, I don't. This isn't a spoiler or anything. You'll be able to enjoy the show just the same. But uh, we spend almost exclusive time in the in in one of the Fallout sh- like shelters and getting to understand how all the vault stuff works and everything. It's all yeah, it's really cool. And then we just cut to you know our secondary character in his storyline with the um, uh, Brotherhood of Steel, which is like oh. Okay, I guess that's the way this is going to work. And then when we come back to the vault dweller, we do the we're exiting the vault scene. And it's very like impactful as a we're finally going to see what the world looks It's like, but we already, we were, <laughs> we, were out, we, yeah. we were just outside with like a whole other character. This feels weird. It's, um, a, dumb, it, it's a dumb yeah, that concept. Sense. Like, it might it be that I, I'm super familiar with like Silo, for instance, which I think does the whole mystery of the outside really oh, yeah. well. Um, but and obviously, like you can't expect Fallout to be the same because it's a different piece of media, etc. But like, I, I would have much preferred it had we, yeah, as I say, like stick do a full story effectively in the vault itself before you start showing people what the outside is because you can't have a, a mystery build up and there's no sense of tension if you already know that there's people out there, which we do because you know we have to go out there immediately. Um, so like, w- we are told then that the main characters are slightly fearful of the outside world, but we already know that that's basically pointless, right? So, yeah. No, yeah, it was. I, I agree. Like you could, like based on what you've said there, that's the way I would want to see this played out. I would want to s- get a little bit of time um, to know the main character within the vault setting, like it's this kind of safe, cocooned world, before they're then like turned loose into the the wasteland beyond it. Because think- that's that that shock of seeing it for the first time. And I don't want to. I don't want to have a foothold in there already by knowing other characters that are already exposed to that. Some people would probably tell you that is what they do. I just don't think they did it very well at all. We don't get a lot of time, and then we get some really weird shit happen pretty quick. Um, I think it was a huge amount of lost potential, and it was a little sad watching it. So I was just like, "That's another one down the drain." Not in terms of it could be a very entertaining TV show for a lot of people, but Fallout is worth so much more than this, and it's like, oh well. Better yeah. luck next time. Um, Grim Vale says, would you recommend traditional publishing for starting authors now, or do you think self-publishing is viable? Uh, whoa. I would always recommend go the traditional publishing route if you can, because one, you get paid advances, which is lovely. It gets it allows you to tide yourself over until you start hopefully earning royalties off your books. Um, and two, they've they've got a marketing network that they can use. They can get you into bookstores. They can potentially even get you into things like supermarkets, which is a huge boon for any writer. If you self-publish, that's it. You're in the wilderness, and you just have to hope that you're going to get noticed. And realistically, you're probably not. And the average, I think, the average self-published author sells like le- le- less than fifty books, and most of them go to friends and family. That's the unfortunate reality of being a self-published author it doesn't really lead anywhere so always if you can aim for an actual publishing deal through a publishing house but you're going to need an agent to do that because they won't um, they won't accept unsolicited manuscripts again that's the other reality of publishing um Nick Johnson says, saw your video on writing tips. It'll be really helpful once I stop procrastinating. On a related note, any tips for a good plot twist? Uh, yeah, that's your first thing. you got to stop procrastinating and actually start writing. But good luck to you. Um, plot twists. Christ, how can I summarize this into a short you know, piece of advice? I guess it has to make sense in the context of the story. It can't be just a complete swerve where you rewrite all your rules just to make this crazy thing happen. Uh, the ideal plot twist should be, wow, I totally didn't expect that, but now that I've seen it, I can't believe I didn't see it coming. That should be the essence of it. It should work within the rules of your story, and ideally it should have little hints, clues, tips that were going to lead the reader towards that if they were able to pick up on them. And if that doesn't work, just make the main villain the daughter of the main character or something. That's the reveal. <laughs> sure. Fight Club's a perfect example. Well, yeah, I mean, like, if you rewatch that movie, you're going to see a lot of things that you didn't pick up on on your first watching. So, yeah, it definitely works pretty well. We could go is that what route. happened? The lost route is basically just, and the twist is none of it matters. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you sunk all of your time into this show. How do you feel? Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say that because with, uh, with, is that what happened with George R. R. Martin that 
you know, there was all these hints that the prince that was promised was should have been Jon Snow, and then he changed it. In uh, the show, at least, changed it, but I think it lines up with what he wants to do. Do you guys know if that's what he decided? Because people kind of made all those connections, the R plus L connection, and then I he don't changed think it. George has specifically said anything on that because he's still trying to salvage something um, from the the book series. Um, the problem that he's got is. He he conceived Game of Thrones as essentially like a, a response to something like The Lord of the Rings, which was a just traditional fantasy heroic story of good versus evil. His was the exact opposite take. He wanted to subvert all the tropes of the fantasy genre and succeeded up to a point, but then because he's got no impulse control and he doesn't know when to like cut his story thread short, he's he's got this monster of a, a an overarching story that he doesn't know what to do with now. Mm. So in terms of like where all that Prince was promised, um, storyline's going to go, no idea. He probably doesn't even know himself. I know that the show fucking destroyed it. That's for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know where he's going to take it. Um, Jesse George says, good April Fool's joke drinker. You got me for a split second. Cheers. I know, yeah. I think I followed it up by not doing any videos for like a week as well, so it just drew it out a little bit more. Scaring all of us like that. Yeah. So rude. I never, I've never done it. You hit all the platitudes perfectly in that video. <laughs> yeah. like, that was that was spot on. It was like an AI had written a, like a <laughs> resignation video. It was perfect. <laughs> Well, I tried to approach it from the point of view of like, okay, if I was doing this for real, what sort of things would I say? Like, like I, I had to make my to, final video. It was like listening to Chris Stockman announce that he's done on YouTube. Only a bit <laughs> yeah. more that was clear inspiration. The part where he said, like, working on a short film, you know, it's changed. I, could, I couldn't resist. I could not resist. <laughs> I, I took it took everything for me to not say like, well, because I'm a filmmaker now and I care so much about the filmmaking process, I can't criticize it anymore. Um, yeah. uh, uh, TGV Monster says, I just wanted to say hi, everyone, and it's good to see Drinker, Mola, Platoon, Baggage Claim, and Despot. These streams give me joy on down days. Thank you, Wonderful. man. Hmm. Glad, Glad to hear. give you some, some enjoyment. Um, Mr. Luca says, most tragic character in film. Ooh. Luke hmm. Skywalker in The Last Jedi. <laughs> Gollum. Possibly. That's a good one, actually. Gollum is a good shout. Yeah. Good choice. It makes me think about like what they go through versus like if someone just got like excessively tortured in some films. Like, I guess mm. they probably, you know, they're up there, but like tragedy on it, you know, like Anakin or something, if despite the criticism we heaped onto the prequels what he goes through <laughs> his whole life's pretty tragic yeah that was his that's right um metal faced rosie says dan Aykroyd or doug walker may be in smiling friends season two like I why is it one it. or the other i hope both of them are but i would love a doug walker cameo that'd be funny as fuck <laughs> they make fun of him all the time so the idea that they contacted him and he agreed would just be that would just be beautiful <laughs> fair enough <laughs> Uh, Barry McCockiner says, can you show your wife on screen? We'd love to see her. Well, Tatiana's in her dungeon right now, so I can't bring her out for this. God, what's wrong with you? It's too late Boy, at night. Screaming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I'm <laughs> screaming. That's rude. <laughs> Don't make me get the hose. Kobus <laughs> uh, Joubert says, when is... Uh, Glurpo coming on as a guest. <laughs> Glurpo? I, I, I imagine they'll end up on uh, Real BBC as a guest, if anything, because me and Az promote their work a lot. Schlepo. Mm, Fantastic art. Yeah. We, basically, what happened was we were talking about Disney Star Wars and how bad everything is, and then we degraded into just, like, at first it was, you know, the bad guys called Schlepo in the new one, just because stupid Star Wars name. And then I accidentally, like, also called the currency in that film Schlepos. And then I named a planet Schlepo, and then everything was Schlepo. And it's just like, why not? And that's, that's <laughs> just go with it. Uh, Lado Berlin says, Dear Drinker, with the attack on critics by the corporation, are you in any way concerned about the new hate speech law in Scotland? Uh, no, not really. It just seems like bullshit, and like everyone's just mocking it into oblivion. So 
I don't know. It feels like a law that's ultimately going to get repealed on the grounds that it's completely impractical. Well, I guess we'll see. Um, how do you guys feel about the attack on critics? You're not allowed to criticize things, guys. Just be nice to everything. As you would imagine, all five of us are very in favor of that. No more critics. Down no more critics. Yeah. Critic. Um, Down with that, the critics. Yeah. By that same sort logic. Of thing. By that same logic, no more quality control. Okay, so Boeing, fire all your quality control guys and just put those planes in the sky and hope for the best. Yeah. I mean, look at how hard they're working on the plane. Yeah, I mean, do you think it's right? easy to build that shit on the factory floor and you're going to come in there and criticize their work just because, you know, if it goes wrong, it might kill a few thousand people? And yeah. they were so I, passionate I and they had so much fun making that plane too. Don't exactly. forget that. Exactly. I care so much about the plane making process that I can't bring myself. I'm to actually, it I'm actually point. making a plane at the minute. I've been, I've been working on it for years. <laughs> I'm a plane maker. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, when these movies fail, you know, it's not like people lose their jobs and end up unemployed, and unable to support their kids, and it's not like people lose billions of dollars and an entire industry goes tits up. No, that doesn't happen. It's just, it's, it's all everything's nice. It's nice that they make movies. But what yeah. would you do if, if you know, let's say this law was passed and like there are no more critics? What, what would you do if you saw somebody criticizing a thing? How would you respond? Would you would you maybe have to be critical of the person doing the, because you know that's sort of how this works, right? To netter it out of existence. If you're criticizing someone for criticizing, you are also doing criticizing yourself. If I didn't know, no, no, that, you have to report to the government and they'll. The they they'll do your thinking for you. You see, yep. platoon. You have to report it because oh. normal people can't be trusted to criticize as things. A, as a true patriot, that's your job to report yeah. it. Probably should have. How did Scotland become such a nation of absolute pussies? I don't understand <laughs> how this happened. Like, because when I was a kid, like everyone was just fucking super aggressive about everything, and like they made fun of everything. Like it was brutal. Um, and it, like at some point, I don't know, I think probably in the last 10, 15 years, we just got pussified. And I don't understand how or when it happened, but I know it it's, just it's did. cliche, but say it's the nation of Braveheart has now been reduced to saying, you may take our freedom, but you may not insult our pronouns. And it's like, yeah. Oh, that's depressing. <laughs> I like that yeah. though. It's just, you may take our freedom. That's it. <laughs> just stop talking. No, it's the same thing that's happened in America too. I mean, the 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 whole idea of candor of being fearlessly candid and providing feedback providing input is completely gone out of fashion and it's perfectly fine for someone to be offended and then if the most offended person has the moral superiority in the room and runs the room and that's happening everywhere from you know any company that you're part of, any like customer meeting you're part of, or even like this is happening at my friend's improv troupe where one person got really offended and like everybody spent the next hour kowtowing to him, whatever he wanted. It's, it's all over the place. It's an interesting currency of, um, of being offended where it just allows you to get whatever you want. Because uh, I don't know, I think it was Jordan Peterson that like said it originally, where he's like, well, the, being offended is a conscious choice on your part, and I don't control that. So why should I be controlled by what you find offensive? Like, why does your your willingness to be offended by things control what everyone else around you is allowed to do? That's not how I'm, society is supposed to function. Was yeah, that a really nice quote then as well? He said, it's like you have a pain in your leg. I believe you, but it has nothing to do with me. Like, <laughs> simple as that pretty much. Yeah, and when did discomfort become a problem? That if you are even in a little bit of discomfort, that needs to be, it's everyone else's responsibility to alleviate it immediately. And the thing is that to use something like that, in even just even a decade ago, would be considered so immoral that you would use your offend, your ability to be offended and hold that, hold an entire room hostage because of your feelings would have been considered such a, a degrading thing to do, that it's such a, so underhanded to use a tactic like that, to manipulate people into agreeing with you. But now it's it's completely commonplace. Not just that, but it's actually considered the moral high ground. Yeah, it's an interesting one, <clears throat> particularly like what the, the long-term repercussions of it are. Like, do you just have a society where no one can actually say or do anything because they might offend someone? 
if you take it to its logical conclusion, that's where you end up. Yes. I mean, uh, eventually people are just going to say, well, it reached that breaking point where the, the fuck you factor comes in and people just say, no, this is stupid. I'm not doing this anymore. It kind of feels like we're, we're almost there. Like well, more and more people are just saying that and just saying, no, I, I'm not. I'm not playing this game anymore because it's fundamentally unwinnable. And you're always going to get someone who's pretending to be offended about something. Uh, we, we can't function like that. There is but. the fuck you factor. And there's also the fact that, you know, that this will inevitably collapse under the weight of its own contradictions eventually. When you've got, say, Gina Carano suing Disney on the grounds of sex discrimination using the same law that they would effectively cite to see her off for criticizing people of other persuasions. When you've got uh, you know gay people having to make rights claims against trans people, when you've got trans people having to make rights claims against women, and, and like this entire legal protected set of categories, when you realise that actually you can't sustain these things unless you're having a completely blind law that covers everyone, they will come into conflict eventually, and then you will start seeing lawsuits from one group against another, and that's a, the point at which it ceases to be workable, except as myth, and then the myth will die eventually as well because the fuck you factor controls that. Um, so, like, eventually it will all go away. It's just that we have to put up with it for another few years at least. Oh, future generations are going to look back on this time with curious eyes. <laughs> what the Definitely. fuck happened to human civilization during this period? And we'll all have to throw our hands up and say, it wasn't my fault. I had around like a, a campfire and say, I was a veteran of the culture wars. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Seen things you people wouldn't believe. Yeah, we let me a lot tell of good you memes about out there. I was there when they released Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you all about the concept of microaggressions. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Well, on that bombshell, I think that's a pretty good way to end this stream, actually, because yeah, it's well over three hours we've been going. So uh, I know we we as usual didn't get through all the super chats. But I will say thank you to everyone who sent them in. We will, of course, cover them all on our catch-up stream. So don't worry yeah. about that. Um, and thank you, I want to say, to my my excellent team of mods for doing the usual great job that you guys do. Thank you to my awesome panel. Um, Despot, Platoon, Baggage Claim, and Mauler. It's always Hello. a pleasure to stream with all of you guys. Um, and for everyone in chat, thank you for joining us tonight. But that's all we've got for today. So go away now. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.